Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you as you join us in the UNIDO ISO Innovation Seminar. Now, this session is organized in partnership with the International Organization for Standardization, or for short, ISO. And I'm very pleased to be your moderator for this session and pleased to let you know that uh, in conjunction with this seminar, we are also hosting the working session of the ISO Technical Committee 279 on Innovation Management, which means that we will be hosting two special sessions related to Working Group 1 and Working Group 3. And I'm also pleased to let you know that this special session today will focus on addressing innovation standards for sustainable development goals, whereby our focus will look into showcasing and the discussion of the key role of innovation standards in enabling sustainable and inclusive industrial development. And here we will have topics that will consider, for example, the advancement of technical cooperation for the mainstreaming of innovation standards series in developing countries. And we will put a bit of focus on small, medium enterprises or the SMEs. We will also be presenting the UNIDO efforts in the field of science, technology and innovation, STI. And I'm pleased to say that we will also be launching the UNIDO ISO Innovation Management Handbook. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome all of you once again and have the pleasure to invite Mr. Hiroshi Kuniochi, UNIDO Deputy to the Director General, to make his welcome remarks. And Mr. Kuniochi will deliver his welcome remarks via a pre recorded video. Please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to this special session organized in partnership with the International Organization for Standardization on addressing innovation standards for sustainable development goals. UNIDO has been working closely with ISO for over 40 years, focusing on supporting developing countries and economies in transition in the development and adoption of international standards, as well as helping public institutions and the private sector in applying and complying with international standards. UNIDO recognizes the key role that standards play in promoting innovation, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the consequent acceleration towards digital transformation. Innovation standards entail great potential to help achieving the 2030 Agenda, particularly SDG 9. Innovation is essential to a country's performance as a crucial engine of economic transformation. This is the case for developing countries in particular. Unlocking their innovation potential can facilitate their transition to the digital economy. Furthermore, <coughs> the world continues to fight the COVID-19 pandemic the effects of climate change and increasing environmental degradation. Their negative economic and social impact is putting a further burden on countries' development efforts. Innovation and new technologies are critical for this revolutionary process. They help boost productivity while accelerating the deployment of renewable energy, optimizing resource utilization, implementing circular economies, and lowering industrial emissions. Innovation has a central role to play in enabling sustainable and inclusive industrial development. It is not only a source of quality job creation and the backbone of any knowledge-based economy, but it also enables vulnerable groups such as women, youth and MSMEs to increase their participation in productive activities. In the light of the great potential innovation had to promote ISID, UNIDO established the UNIDO STI Working Group. This is a special task force with the objective to provide strategic direction for STI-related activities and cooperation across UNIDO departments, as well as within the UN system 
and with non-UN organizations. UNIDO is a founding member and active contributor to the UN technology facilitation mechanism. From the start, UNIDO has participated in different work streams of the UN Interagency Task Team on science, technology and innovation. Other relevant actions to promote innovation are carried out by our network of ITPOs, Investment and Technology Promotion Offices. The ITPO network provides support by developing tools and mobilizing resources to boost innovation. Currently, UNIDO has nine ITPOs across the world. The UNIDO ITPO network has contributed to reducing development imbalances by facilitating investment and technology agreements between developed countries, developing countries, and countries with economies in transition. ITPOs support countries in their efforts to develop the potential of industry to drive socioeconomic progress through trade, investment, and innovation. UNIDO has actively participated in the development of the ISO 56002-2019 Innovation Management System Guidance as an active member of the ISO TC279. Jointly with ISO, UNIDO simultaneously drafted an innovation handbook with the aim of disseminating it in developing countries. It serves as a capacity development tool for standard bodies, innovation institutions, and academia. This handbook will be officially launched today, providing a practical set of tools and methods to countries for more and better innovation towards an inclusive and sustainable development. Distinguished delegates, initiatives like this are crucial to raise awareness on the role and potential standards and innovation have to tackle today's world challenges and towards more inclusive and sustainable economies. We are very pleased to have both on-site experts and representatives active in innovation and standards-related initiatives. Thank you for joining this session. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuniochi. Please let me now proceed to welcome a message from Mr. Sergio Mokiha, the General, Secretary General of the International Organization for Standardization. Mr. Mokiha's message will be read by Ms. Monica Ibido, who is with us here today physically. Ms. Ibido, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Mr. Sergio Mujica, Secretary General of ISO, International Organization for Standardization, whether you are joining virtually or participating physically in Vienna, it's my great pleasure to welcome you on the innovation seminar hosted by UNIDO. As you might expect, the topic covered by this exciting hybrid event, boosting innovation standard for SDGs, is one that is close to our organization. As an organization that, that represents 167 member countries around the world, active across literally hundreds of technical areas, ISO is known for many things. But during our Secretary General tenure, he has made it a central part of the ISO mission to reinforce the link between ISO standards and the complex problems inherent in meeting the 2030 agenda. To borrow a phrase from Thomas Edison, one of the worst, most prolific uh, problem solvers, there is a better way to do it, find it. So in other words, innovate. The joint work of UNIDO and ISO specifically supports all those who recognize that innovation is the answer, but may be uncertain of the best way to go about it. Thanks to the work of ISO TC 279 on innovation management, supported by UNIDO, 
that's about to change. It is deeply significant that we have recently jointly published the Innovation Management System Handbook. This landmark publication is uh, a wealth of practical information for business and organization of all sizes who are looking for that better way. It is for those who would benefit from a systematic way to harness the most creative ideas and to put innovation at the center of their approach to sustainable growth. Together, we have created wide range guidance that enables the innovation journey to be formalized, structured and brought to life through the use of an ISO 56000 innovation management system. Such systems enable organizations to develop and enhance their innovation capability by understanding the various elements and their interaction and by providing the means to plan, support, implement, and measure innovation activities. This last element in, is a fundamental step in achieving continuous improvement. One of the strengths of the partnership between UNIDO and ISO is the scope of our combined activities. The result is that our work speaks to an uncommonly broad mix of organizations. In combining our perspective, knowledge, and expertise, I believe that we have produced a publication of exceptional versatility. With that said, it should be noted that the focus of our approach in, is on small and medium enterprises. These businesses are the backbone of economies, both developed and emerging. Successful SMEs typically operate in an agile way with startups that ability to improvise is often a defining feature. But with individuals often expected to perform very roles, it can be challenging to introduce the structured approach that is essential to long-term growth. Given these dynamics, our partnership has a particular focus on boosting properly managed innovation in both SMEs and startups. In applying this approach, UNIDO ISO work is focusing on support where it's most needed. That's one part of the thinking behind our plan to mainstream ISO 56,000 for African countries. Over the years, ISO TC 279 has worked hard to achieve wide and balanced participation, attracting the involvement of almost 70 countries. With this is great progress, Africa remains lightly represented. And it's our hope that ongoing efforts and the visibility of events such as this one will help improve African representation. Today's innovation seminar and Thursday lab are both about a different way of doing things. Thanks to the joint event, we cannot only share best practices and the latest ideas, but further leverage on our special partnership to strengthen innovation capacity in SMEs and foster the innovation ecosystem that will contribute to realizing the UN SDGs. ISO is proud to be part of that. And we would like to thank our partner UNIDO for their vision, their organization in helping to bring to life this unique today forum that will help make manage innovation a daily reality. On behalf of Mr. Sergio Mujica, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Ibido. We now have the honor to hear from His Excellency, Mr. Riyad Mezol, Minister of the Ministry of Industry, Trade, Investment, and the Digital Economy of the Kingdom of Morocco. His Excellency will address us via a pre-recorded video. Please, thank you. Mr. Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be invited of this special, to this special session of UNIDO ISO Innovation Seminar and be given the opportunity to convey on behalf of Morocco our approach on standards and partnerships for promoting innovation in SMEs in order to achieve an inclusive and sustainable industrial development, I said. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, above all, I wish to draw your attention on the rise of geopolitical risk posed namely by the war in Ukraine, the negative impacts of COVID-19 crisis, 
climate change and escalation of environmental degradation, which hinder countries' development efforts and exacerbate their social inequalities. Against this background, innovation induces structural change in economies and societies and plays an important role in economic development. As a member of ISO since 1963, Morocco has adopted many international standards, namely among others on innovation management, strategic intelligence management, creativity, and intellectual property management, relevant for its economy in order to assist the knowledge and the technology transfer to Moroccan companies. As of now, there are more than 16,000 Moroccan standards derived from international norms, whether for products, management system, or manufacturing best practices, intending to assist Moroccan business practices with innovative solutions in compliance with international standards. To manage standardization and related activities, Morocco has established in 2016 a National Technical Committee on Innovation Management, which include stakeholders from public and private sectors, universities, and testing laboratories. In addition, by participating in Innovation Management Technical Committee session of ISO, Morocco has shown a keen interest in the drafting of international standards on innovation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, UNIDU's mandate for ICED is anchored within the International 2030 Agenda, which includes, which includes SDG number 9, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. This SDG recognizes that the industrial sector can serve as a primary engine of not only job creation and economic growth, but also of technology transfer, investment flows, and skills development, especially toward least developed countries via a South-South and triangular cooperation mechanism. Thus, I commend UNIDO's role in establishing and maintaining public-private partnership platforms to facilitate financing and the exchange of knowledge, best practices, and expertise that will spur innovation. Moreover, as an illustration of a win-win partnership with UNIDO, I look forward to UNIDO's country partnership program to foster the scale-up of innovation projects, particularly in those of highly innovative SMEs. Morocco has undertaken another step to help drive innovation by setting up intellectual property marketplace, platform that seeks, among other things, matchup of companies looking for technical solutions with R&D organizations such as university and research centers. This marketplace dedicates also a space to a bank of innovative projects for young entrepreneurs and innovative SMEs interested in open source technologies. Also, at the global level, innovation has an important role to play for Morocco in its commitment to keep up with climate change expectation of COP26 and to comply with it, its industrial priorities such as decarbonization. In this regard, I commend the innovative solutions launched by UNIDO Investment and Technology Promotion Office of Shanghai through the 2022 Global Call for Innovative Solutions. To be able to achieve this ambition, it is imperative to call for a new paradigm on how to approach innovation. I call on UNIDO to help set up programs that would foster effective innovation that requires clear and properly executed strategies, disciplined leadership, in a genuine innovation culture. Mr. Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency, for that very motivating message. I now have the honor to announce Her Excellency Ms. Stella Tembisa Davini Abrahams, Minister of the Ministry of Small Business Development of South Africa, who is with us virtually connected your Excellency, thank you very much for connecting with us. You now have the floor. Thank you. Your Excellency, you're, you have to unmute yourself. Am I now audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, moderator. Let me start by greeting yourself. I uh, greet my fellow panelists, 
whom amongst them is the UNIDO's Deputy Director General, the Secretary General of ISO, ministers from Congo and Morocco, the AU Commissioner, all participants, and most importantly, the innovators and entrepreneurs out there. Let me start by thanking the organizers from UNIDO for inviting me to provide a short input into this important session on standards and partnerships for promoting innovation in SMMEs and startups. Madam Moderator, as a country, we are implementing our economic recovery and reconstruction plan, which aims at building back better. In other words, a faster growing, more digital, greener, and more inclusive economy. We are implementing several structural reforms aimed at improving effi efficiencies in our network industries, cutting red tape, and putting in place the ecosystem we need for innovation-led growth. We have placed SMMEs at the center of our agenda. Program director, as I continue with this point, as government, we have developed a number of industry master plans. And as the Department of Small Business Development, we have developed our own master plan, the National Integrated Small Enterprise Development Plan. Our plan forms part of our national government's third strategic integrated plan for the development and support of the SMME sector. Our evaluation of the previous two national strategies has shown that as government, we were too inward looking. We didn't place enough emphasis on mobilizing and leveraging all role players behind entrepreneurship and small businesses. The NISDAT plan corrects this by taking an ecosystem approach, enabling various public and private sectors to operate in a targeted, collaborative, and coordinated manner. Program director, we see entrepreneurship and innovation as two sides of the same coin. We have a national system of innovation, which takes a triple helix approach, drawing in government, knowledge and innovation institutions, such as our state research institutions and higher education institutions, together with the industry and business. Our role as a department is to ensure that the innovation system we are facilitating is inclusive and benefits the underserved SMMEs, such as those that are black owned, women, youth, and of course, in the rural and township owned by those that come from the boundary stands. Our aim is to build a faster growing and productivity led economy that is at the same time more equal. We do not believe these are mutually exclusive intents. Over-concentration and high levels of inequality are constraints to growth. We have adopted a differentiated model in which different kinds of innovation and entrepreneurship support are provided to innovators and entrepreneurs at various stages of growth. This includes step-by-step -step guidance to early stage startups from ideation through to scale up. This includes access to technology, incubation and acceleration for free business development services and access to finance, including blended finance, loans and links to angel investors, venture capital and crowdfunding. Pitching opportunities, hackathons, and innovation challenges are critical to connect early stage entrepreneurs with financial, technological, and market access support. And we really appreciate the support of UNIDO in this regard. Of particular significance is the support to connect startups to technology networks, including universities, research institutions, science councils, intellectual property and innovation agencies, local and international industrial technology supplies. Our entity CEDA is developing many interventions which provide a useful platform around which we can further collaborate with UNIDO 
and other useful platform around which we can further collaborate and the product testing on design, on quality systems and many other interventions. These incubators include technology demonstration centers, focused on demonstrating, exhibiting and providing training in the use of available technologies, especially with regards to value chain adding processes, as well as technology incubators we are developing, including the Innovation Bridge with DSI, TIA, the CSIR and the World Bank and our own SMMESA portal. I would like again to thank UNIDO for the impactful support they are providing to South African startup community. Working together, we will take the country forward to a more inclusive economy built on innovation and productivity-led growth. Madam Moderator, I thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for that insightful and comprehensive remarks. And thank you very much again for connecting with us virtually. So we are far yet near. So thank you very much. And with this, colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I've now I can now conclude our opening session where you've heard key messages from speakers who have shown us how important it is to discuss innovation, ISO standards, the SDGs, and inclusive and sustainable industrial development. With this, I'd like to thank our honourable speakers again, and I would li now like to pass the time to Mr. Johan Clare, Chair of the ISO TC 279, to take us into the next session of this uh, afternoon's programme. Thank you very much. I'm not going to be alone for this session. So please, uh, Raymond and Monica, if you want to join, we'll start talk together. We have some magical stuff in this room, so let's use it. Everyone is there. So, um, hi everyone. Thank you for your participation to this uh, seminar. Uh, before to introduce my my colleagues there, uh, let's start with maybe a few words on uh, this ISO committee and what we are doing together. So, I have the honor to be the chair of ISO TC two seven nine. Uh, so, the in the ISO Technical Committee on Innovation Management. Uh, we have a lot of words and acronyms, so please, I hope we'll, we'll try not to use them too much for people that do not do not know them so well. So ISO TC 279, each ISO TC, a technical committee has a number, 279 is about innovation management. This technical committee, maybe in two slides, if we can have them on the screen, that's going to come soon. Um, this technical committee aims to work on innovation management and so developing, as it has been said in the introduction, developing more innovation uh, capabilities within organization, getting to work with more innovation up there. Um, so the, our technical committee, so the, the, you have the scope here. Can you, do you manage to have the, the screen on? It's fighting on. <laughs> so yeah, the scope is standardization of terminology tools and methods and interaction between relevant parties to enable innovation. And we participate to several of these sustainability goals um so the development goals and we're very happy with that of course innovation uh, creates maybe some stuff in the past uh, and but now we are we, we all expect that it will move to uh, more innovation and sustainability in the world uh, two more information about this technical commission what we're doing so you have then on the next slide maybe um the participation this is who participate to this technical committee we are like 69 countries participating to this which is a large part of the world, but we we'll still want to go um, further in that direction. We'll talk about that later. And um, maybe then a few words on what has been published in this technical committee on the next slide. Uh, you can see that we have, well, we're organizing several groups in this technical committee and we published already a few documents. One more click here. 
So we work on innovation management system development. Click on. <laughs> Thank you. We work on vocabulary. We work on several tools and methods. We work on assessment. Uh, can you? Oh, that's too much. Thank you. And in the gray now, you have what is under development. So what people are going to work on, uh, especially during this session, because it's a full day of, of working. And um, we are now going to talk about this blue square. Uh, so this handbook on ISO 56002, that's called publication between ISO and UNIDO. Um, and now, so just to give you an overview that was linked to this ISO 56002 standard, and I thought it was important just to give you an overview of this before to hey, ask question to my neighbor here so we can move to the next slide finally to talk about this ISO 56002 Innovation Management System Handbook. On my side here, um, I have two uh, experts that participate uh, strongly in that technical committee. So. Flo Monica Gutierrez, uh, first, so you are a coordinator for quality management in research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, directly coming from Mexico for this session. Thank you very much to be here. And Mr. Raymond Tavares, a representative for oh, country office in Cameroon at UNIDO, but you used to have some previous uh, responsibilities also and had to participate, uh, well, you participated and represented UNIDO in the drafting of that handbook. Thanks to both of you to be here. Um, let me start with one question to you, Monica. Um, so ISO TC279, we use that acronym. It's about standard and innovation and the handbook. Uh, with the handbook we're, we're talking is related to ISO 56002 innovation management system. Maybe can you explain us in a few words what is this standard and what, what is this ISO management system, innovation management system thing? Yes, uh, thank you, Johan, for, for the question. And first of all, I would like to, to say that it's a very great pleasure to me to join the stage with you, but also with Raymond. And thank you also for ISO and UNIDO for the invitation to, to be here today. Well, ISO 50, 56001, as you mentioned, is the Innovation Management System Standard, and it was published in 2019, and it's based basically in best practices of two body of knowledge, uh, innovation, but also management, and the standard was drafted by a, a considerable group of experts from our group, as you mentioned, uh, our technical committee is con constituted by around uh, 50, more than 50 countries right now. And those countries, most of them appointed some experts uh, of their countries to um, develop this uh, standard. So all these experts have different background and we, we expend four years actually in writing it. And here it is very important to highlight that standards, we know that the standards are one of the best and cheapest way to disseminate knowledge through uh, the approximately 200 members of ISO. So it's not only those uh, countries that are participating actively, actively in our technical committee, but all of them that are around 200 countries. So um, when we started drafting this standard, uh, that was very a uh, very important driver. That our main objective was to develop uh, an easy to follow guide for implementing uh, all these management uh, and innovation best practices to help organizations, um, especially SMEs, uh, to um, increase their competitiveness. So that was basically our main objective and the main objective of, of is ISO 7602. Thank you, Monica. So this is about getting more performance and especially in innovation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for, for this. So, Raymond, uh, we're talking about, well, providing supporting in the organization, especially SMEs in developing, getting more performance and more innovation. 
Well, I was about to ask you why Unido found some interest in this technical committee and this document. I'm, uh, I'm afraid to give part of the answer in the question, but what, so Unido became a liaison uh, and then uh, with, with ISO TC 279 and then initiate this handbook um, topic. Could you tell us this, the story? How, how, how did that happen and how that has been developed in, in, at Unido? Thank you very much, uh, Johan. And I would like to recognize some of the friends I met during the meetings of developing the standards and uh, when it was approved in, uh, in Stockholm, I remember. And also the work we have been doing in the handbook with uh, a long time and a uh, lot of fights, but we, here we are. Actually, I'm coming. Johan forgot to mention it from uh, directly from Yaoundé far away from Cameroon, because it's my new role now, representing UNIDO in Central Africa. And so in those countries, you have seen the desert. The desert is Africa, members. We, as UNIDO, we try to make them to participate to the drafting of the standards. But we did not succeed to have a full engagement and also full participation. It was for the inclusiveness. But right now with this handbook, this was the reason we want them to know what we are talking about because they keep asking us, hey guys, you need, you talk about innovation, but we don't know really what you are talking about because you are not providing us a concrete tool. Mm -hmm. And this really is a tool. And you need to, as you rightly mentioned, Johan, we started, the first step was to be liaison member. We want to be there where they discuss about innovation tool because the market is mature enough to make this jump, to make a guide for innovation and innovative institutions. You need to join the train of ISO and the expert. For us, the handbook right now you have, and we are going today to distribute, to disseminate to everybody and lately to the countries is a tool for innovation process management for us is also a tool to strengthen the productive capacities because this is the main mandate of UNIDO, the productive capacities of countries. The handbook is a supportive approach for inclusiveness. This is also a way to include that part of the world, Africa, but Latin America, Asia, also to the new industrial revolution, innovation to help them to acquire the new technologies. The handbook is an accelerator for us for the SDGs achievement, because when all the countries that need to be part of this humanity will acquire the new technologies, we can talk with them in a very easy manner. Now the respect of the environment, how to manage the environment using new technologies, how to be more digital, to be resilient. So it's really contributing to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals as an accelerator. And so, uh, Johan, I wanted just to say, UNIDO supported the participation of institutions from developing countries. We try with Nigeria, we try with also uh, Peru through a project to pay the participation even of the standard body members. For some of them we succeeded, they participate for others, no, for the drafting of the standard because we wanted a kind of diversity of approach on the innovation levels of modus operandi, the way that innovation is happening in those countries to be considered in those committees, in the working groups of the TC 279. UNIDO and ISO partnership is not only, like you mentioned it, or my director general mentioned it, it's not new. We have been doing it for other let's say standards previously and join handbooks. And Monica, thank you for also reminding that in your, in, in your speech. The objective right now, and I will stop there, uh, have been to remain among others. We, ISO and UNIDO, we start working on some guides to build the trust for trade. We wanted also to protect the consumers and the workers. We do it together. We would like, and we did it together to improve the use of energy in industrialization, in doing business. We did it and we made some guidebooks. Today we are here, we would like to boost innovative capacities 
of enterprises and institutions. That's why we try and we started the journey. This is just a milestone and we'll continue doing it later with ISO and all of you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Raymond. Um, so as Raman said, you had previous work on different handbooks and other collaboration between ISO and UNIDO on, on, on developing handbooks. Um, Monica, th th have you heard about some of them? And how does you know hand handbooks work with standards? Because Raymond said, well, we need something practical. So can you say that standard is not completely practical? How do you we organize these two levels? Why do we need those two levels finally? Yes, thank you, Johan. That's a very interesting question. What, well, what we know from research is that actually uh, implementing standards um, helps organizations to uh, better conduct themselves. No, so we know that implementing standards um, made that organizations improve in many different areas. One that is very notable is that their operations become more efficient, but also they are able to better uh, knowledge, uh, sorry, better manage their knowledge. And those both things are very important for um, companies or organizations who want to innovate and to be more innovative. And those are only two examples of, of many more that are in literature. So those are the side of the standards, no? And what about the handbooks? Well, handbooks are the guide for implementing the standards. And ISO has been very successful in writing very good handbooks, easy to follow, um, for organizations, that means that organizations don't really need um, consultancies, uh, consultants, or spending a lot of time in they are able to get these handbooks and to get advantage of them. So uh, we have had some, uh, as I mentioned, very successful handbooks. One of them is the one uh, about ISO 9001 application for SMEs. And this handbook has been so successful and widely applied that lead to the development of other very successful handbooks like the one of medical devices or the integrated management system. So um, that's mainly the difference between the standard and, and handbook. Thank you. So a compliment, a needed compliment for, yeah, to sustain this, to support the deployment in all kinds of organizations. Thank you very much. So, well, you had this in between ISO and UNIDO, finally a common wish uh, to increase innovation capabilities and among the world and a common awareness of the linkage between innovation and sustainability, a shared conviction that handbooks may help standards deployment. So this is how finally it started. And, and we're happy that this story started. Uh, Raymond, what was your, when, well, you, when I, you need to propose to work on this, what were the key points that were the most important for, for UNIDO in this development? Thank you, Johan. And I wanted also uh, to, to thank uh, Monica for reminding that aspect that the two are complementary. And actually this is the way uh, we took it. And so, so uh, and we got the support of ISO to say, like it was the case for the ISO 9001, when I said build a trust for trade. So we did it together with ISO and it facilitated. Because for us, the handbook aims to be a conducive and friendly mirror for SMEs. And actually when we started, it was a developing countries, but we, with the experts, some of them are here, when uh, with your guidance, John, uh, uh, we try really, to make it as something very practical for the SMEs. And the people here, they use examples, the daily life of SMEs to, trans, to transmit it or to transcript it in the handbook. This obviously help a lot to have a practical guide, which can help the SMEs to see very clearly what we talk about, but to have the elements they can touch because they can continue measuring, estimating also 
uh, their, their progress on innovation. In the meantime, I think this is a bit uh, provocative, but uh, I think we try to expand, explain and elaborate sometimes other aspects and vision of innovation, uh, which are less considered and captured by economists, experts from not developing countries. Huh? So this is the way sometimes the definition of, you know, of, of uh, innovation, it could be also the way they measure and they consider what is innovation, what is not innovation, because we took some practical examples saying them for SMEs, it makes sense. It's a knowledge transfer. It is really something new, which is adding value to what they are doing. So the handbook contributes to the process of creation uh, of an innovation also ecosystem. For us, it is very important for UNIDO uh, because in other part of the world, uh, the ecosystem exists and it is even connected. We as UNIDO, we started talking about a national innovation system. And after that, we start connecting, making them to communicate. We give tools after that to the enterprises to say, but you have a role to play and because there is an ecosystem. So we put the part of one of the puzzle which are missing. So everything was like step by step, but we are getting there. As this handbook really is helping us to go progressively on this, the creation of innovation ecosystem in the developing countries in order to benefit fully from the fourth industrial revolution and to accept, to acquire and to absorb new technologies because some of them are still telling us we are not yet to the third industrial revolution and you want us to join the first industrial revolution. But with this piece of the puzzles, we are really also building an ecosystem. And this also is a, not remote, but one of the scope of this handbook. Thank you. So you are in for a tool for SMEs and for ecosystems, the same tool that would be able yeah, to build up this ecosystem or to deploy innovation in several directions, several kind of innovation, defining this as well. Well, I hope it has been fully complete with the document, but I guess so. <laughs> uh, Monica, um, let's, um, how does that work? I mean, um, when, how, how did the, what, how that document has been published or well has been drafted and so on? How, how does that work? Who is writing? Who, who are the authors behind this document? How, how, how that works at ISO? Yes, uh, thank you, Johan. Um, well, as mentioned, as I mentioned before, uh, the first step is that countries appoint uh, some national delegates and we call them experts to join this effort to create a handbook or a standard like the ones we are talking about. So we were very lucky uh, that in this task force that created this handbook, some of the experts of our working group that developed ISO uh, 56002 were, were working in, in the handbook, but also uh, we uh, were very lucky to have some UNIDO experts like Raymond join to the, to the task force. So we have very brilliant people, very experts, uh, very highly experts, experience in innovation and also management and how to deploy these kind of projects, innovation projects in real life in organizations um, drafting this document. So uh, this is how it worked. We had a lot of uh, technical discussions. Uh, I think one really important issue we addressed since the beginning was that the, the handbook needed to be a tool easy to follow to SMEs. And this actually drive our work and hopefully users of this document uh, will you know, tell us uh, that we achieve successfully this objective. Thank you. Uh, so a document that has been drafted by doers, not only by thinkers. 
in the end. People who experience innovation, work with companies directly and so on. I think that's very important. And also not coming only from one part of the world, but coming from all over the world. This is probably another very important uh, inputs to this. So, well, I'm happy to show you this. It's done, it's here. Uh, so that's a great, great progress. And um, now two last question for each of you, but now it's done, it's here, but we need people to use that and, and to deploy. So what's the plan? How can ISO support the deployment of such a document once it's, once it's published? How does that work? Where, where can people find this? Oh, maybe for you, Monica, first with ISO, and then we'll see how Unido is going to deploy this. Okay, well, um, actually, is uh, the way that ISO deploy it is through its ISO store that can be um, uh, reached by actually anyone who has an internet connection. No, so anyone who is interested in getting this handbook only needs a computer and internet connection and in few clicks you can get it it's as simple as that so e easy to get there and uh how about you how will you need to support this deployment what's what's the plan and how can we push that to anyone to improve innovation capabilities thank you Thank you, Johan. It's good you mentioned it because I remember one way I was still from this side of the world. We fought to get with ISO the possibility uh, to translate this document in different languages because we are UN, so we need people also to read it in their language. And so we happen to make it, and I think we are in the process of making it Spanish and French, where I came from, many, many speak French in Portuguese, after that in Russian, and so uh, in Chinese, that's the first step to make it accessible, not only in English. The first thing was also to have it available in all our programs. Maybe it could be also something we just insert in what we are already doing in capacity building. Okay, you are training them on other things, but this also is a management tool that can be used. And the other thing is we have a knowledge hub here where we store all the tools we are developing at Unido. We're also using the online, the people. Mm -hmm. I cannot say we are lazy. They are maybe also much more open-minded. They can use it to dial and so to do it online. So I think we have tried and we have started also that process of transferring all of that also on very interactive way on online tool. And where we would like to go practically because when we do the training, we need also people to coach them because they need sometimes the step-by-step -step also assistance. And for that one, it's with you, Johan, or other people we are discussing, like also uh, with Magnus here and other people, we are discussing the way we can develop a program in some countries. In, in, in Central Africa, we are talking about a program also, which is not only the capacity building, the coaching, also maybe linkages that need to be created on uh, really taking those MSMEs step-by-step step towards themselves acknowledging the capacities of innovation. So we definitely would like to start with Africa, where there was a desert, but Latin America and other part. And believe me, when it was being drafted, the last part of the work was expert from the Western on Asian the industrialized countries. And many examples, they were telling us, no, but it should be also usable in our part of the world. And Joan, you managed with that one. We have a document which can be used everywhere. But as far as UNIDO is concerned, we are going to start from the member states and it will be in Africa, in Latin America. The handbook is an additional tool for digital and green transition because we should be very pragmatic with them. We are telling them green transition, we are telling them digitalization, but innovation is at the backbone of all those trends. So this is a concrete input, an instrument which support the UNIDO slogan and vision, progress by innovation. That sounds like a perfect conclusion. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Freeman. So to sum up, yeah, it's an important tool. It's an important stone we have to build on with 
So supporting for putting it in for program, using in consultancy, using in direct uh, directly within the within the at the SMEs, deploying this in English, but also deploying it in other languages. Well, wow, we still have a lot to work on, but it's there. The first the, the keystone is is now present, and that's a great thing. Thank you very much. Thank you for in your well in personal investment in this drafting and in the next for the next step as well because i'm sure that you will be uh, key partners for keeping on deploying that document um in yeah through through iso and through unido thank you very much we're going to leave the floor for the next uh next session now which is going to talk about a panel discussion about partnership for boosting innovation and smes in startups um and uh, yeah in smes and startups uh, leave the floor to well Yermo, i guess you're going to moderate the next session so i'm going to leave you the floor Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, keep on talking about this innovation. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, uh, sitting from the other side of the table. So uh, also will require for me much more neutrality and uh, trying also to be uh, doing the work they ask me to do here to moderate a very, very important panel on really how to boost, uh, we call it here partnership for boosting innovation in SMEs and startups. And so when I discuss with the panelists, it's very clear. So we all agree on one thing. The partnership in the, is a key word. And if you're familiar with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of humanity, it's not on the UN. There is always the mistake of the UN, but I think it is for the countries. They all agree that those are the 17 most important goals they would like to achieve by 2030. And by the way, while coming here that day in Cameroon, they were doing a self-evaluation on how best, how good they have been on achieving the 17 SDGs. And partnerships in the 17th, which they said all the other objectives could not be achieved if the, we don't have partnership. And in our job on innovation, it seems that it is also important, even if it seems sometimes when we compete, we are less eager to cooperate, to partner. And here it's not antagonist, we said partnership for boosting innovation on small companies, and startups. Today, I have the privilege to have with me experts from different profiles, but also different provenience and experiences on the private sector, academic, also institutions, international organizations here. So I have five illustrious panelists. Two are here with me in presence physically present here in Vienna, and the three are around the world. So I will start introducing those who are here with me. So I have with me here, 
Miss Isabel, uh, who is normally, if I remember very well, because I think she's from Portugal. I think I should not say I think. So definitely she is from Portugal. And she has been working uh, at university level, but most recently, Isabel Islemi, she is the president of the technical committee for innovation management. And she leads the kickoff phase of new committee for artificial intelligence in Portugal. So experience, expertise, real life, also on innovation and SMEs she has. I'm very glad to have you here in this panel. Welcome. So I have also uh, another, but friend, I can say, but experts on innovation coming from the northern part of the world and coming from uh, Sweden. I remember we met when really we, we said now it's over the standards on uh, innovation management system standards. So Magnus Carlson, welcome. So you would like to remind to the audience here and those who are listening to us that you are the chairman of the national mirror committee and innovation management experts at CIS, Swedish standard body. Here you mentioned Swedish Institute of Standards. So we are glad to have you. You have played a very dynamic role in the working group number one, and not only because this is the one I know where I've been interacting with you, but so in the drafting of the handbook. Welcome. Thank you. Magnus. Thank you. And uh, from the other side of the screen, I have, I will start uh, presenting Miss Diana Battaglia. I happen to know her because uh, Diana Battaglia has played an important role in, in Italy. She was parliamentarian, uh, I remember in 94, but she's since 2004 the head and director of the Investment Technology Promotion Office of UNIDO. She has experience on supporting SMEs, but also on developing very sustainable institutions to help companies in Italy and around the world to flourish. Ms. Diana Battaglia, Welcome, I'm very glad to see you also from there. I would have loved to see you here in Vienna. <laughs> Thank Are you. Are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So I will also go to, uh, to thank another colleague and friend. I think it's almost midnight where he is. Uh, he is the head of the ITPO, uh, Japan, and uh, he still with us, Mr. Yuko Yasunaga. He is obviously an engineer, but worked very well with SMEs and innovation and standards, by the way, because he played a critical role also in the standard body and developing quality institutions and quality infrastructure in Japan. Mr. Yuko Yasunaga, are you? Ah, okay, you're with us. Welcome, thank you. I'm glad to have you here with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So I have also my colleague, Vanessa Fol Folkel. I hope I pronounce it well. This is the only language I still need to learn. Uh, so my colleague from uh, deputy head of the ITPO, still remain Investment Technology Promotion Office of UNIDO in Germany. And uh, so She's a colleague, very well known also, and doing plenty of good experience around the world. So Vanessa, good morning or good afternoon actually. And so I'm very glad to meet you in person. This is the first time I meet you online. Uh, we met in Vienna a long time ago, but uh, this is the first time we're having a kind of conference together online. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Raymond. So I'm also here. I hope you can see my video as well, because I can't see it yet on the screen. Um, my name you pronounced very well. <laughs> can we just check if the video works? Because 
actually, I just see the slide. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. So and you I can see like me. Ask, yeah. Yeah. Okay. To ask to ask you to help me to really uh, interact with the audience, but also those who are online on the main topic of today. And as we discuss, we are going to start. The first question I would like to ask you all to share with us your experience on boosting innovation through partnership collaboration. I think it is important also we get it clear here in the room, but also those who are listening to us. So I would like to start with Diana, and we agree I will call you with your first name. So Diana, uh, can you tell us, you know, everybody sees you as the head of that office, but silently you're contributing to innovation of startups and SMEs around the world, not only in Italy. Can you tell us about your experience, Diana? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Raymond, and very good afternoon. And many thanks to the organizers for having involved us in this great initiative. Um, I'm Diana, and I head of uh, Italy, uh, an office with uh, the unique mandate uh, to support private sector in emerging countries, promoting investments, uh, technology transfer, and uh, capacity building initiative with the framework of ad hoc international development cooperation programs. Namely, we consider sustainable investments, applied innovations and uh, technologies as a strategic driver to uh, unlock the untapped potential of emerging countries, turning challenges into opportunity. In addition to this, we are convinced that the one of the most strategic sectors in which Italian SMEs uh, excels uh, and which can bring developing countries out of poverty is uh, agritech. As agriculture remains the backbone of uh, uh, economic activity and employment in the most developing country, uh, food tech and agriculture and innovation are strategic drivers to unlock the untapped potential and catalyze a new generation of investment opportunities that leverage the ability of many countries to leapfrog into the future. For this reason, for um, since 2015, uh, the year of the Universal Expo in Milan dedicated to agriculture, we have organized uh, several editions of our international award aimed at identified innovative ideas and technologies in agribusiness that could lead to social, environmental, and economic improvements once implemented in developing countries, creating a virtuous cycle of connection and collaboration uh, between private, uh, academic, financial, and institutional world. In the various edition of uh, our award, organized in collaboration with the leading partner, such as among other, uh, the Italian National Research Council and the Future Food Institute, we have collected more than 1,000 projects from over uh, 100 countries and uh, five continents around the world, paving the way for important collaborations on business and innovation models that respond to the needs and challenges uh, of emerging countries in the agricultural field, positioning us uh, as a mentor and uh, advisor in a series of global forum, conferences, uh, and events featuring many incubators, accelerators, and stakeholders operating food tech uh, and agricultural innovation in order to discuss uh, and share best practices for sustainable agriculture production and food security. We don't need more food, but more technology and applied innovations to bring about economic growth and lift people out of poverty in developing countries. Just to give you some concrete examples regarding the scope of this innovative bottom-up proposal, I want to mention some of them. 
Uh, like, for example, the Italian participated startup uh, Afla Zero that has developed a post-harvest ozone-based treatment technology which eliminates 98% of aflatoxin contamination in grains and other crops. Uh, mycotoxin that seriously affects food security and human health in emerging countries causing cancer, stunting, and lower immunity to disease. Or for example, um, Atmonia. Atmonia, a women lead Icelandic startup that produce uh, an on-farm zero carbon nitrogen fertilizer obtained exclusively uh, from air, water, and re um, renewable energy uh, with the no CO2 emissions, uh, no handling, no transportation, no uh, hazardous materials, easily turned on off, uh, optimized for renewable energy, applicable with fertilization, minimal leaching, all at a competitive cost. Or also the Italian research product, uh, project, uh, um, phosphate, that has conceived a sustainable uh, phosphorus-based fertilizer made from recycled phosphate-rich fishery byproducts. Uh, and uh, Farm Crowdy, the largest Nigerian digital agriculture platform, focused uh, on the connection between sponsor and farmers. In short, uh, uh, all projects uh, that demonstrate how important it is to push the new UNIDO motto, uh, progress by innovation, through the enhancement of bottom-up ideas and the contribution of young startup entrepreneurs, adopting our expertise and evolving uh, our initiative into a wider initiative with the UNIDO Global Four uh, innovative ideas and technology versus COVID-19 and beyond, organized in the 2020 and become a flagship initiative for the entire ITPO network and for UNIDO in general. Thank you very much, Diana. You have been uh, impressive because you also respect the time, one minute out, but I was just listening to you very, very passionate, passionate but also you mentioned uh, the really innovation is possible in, in those countries also in the agri or agri-related sector. Thank you very much for that experience. Um, I will ask uh, now Vanessa from uh, the ITPO Germany um, also to tell us how cooperation and partnership help you to boost innovation on smaller enterprises. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Raymond, for the invitation to speak on this uh, session. And um, the successful experience from the UNIDO Global Call 2020, which ITPO Italy conducted, that I would say showed that innovative solutions for the global challenges exist in the private sector, and that support and the right partnership, uh, partnerships are needed to scale up those solutions. And especially in the area of climate change, we urgently need innovative solutions. So this is why we at the ITPO Germany conducted last year then the UNIDO Global Call on Innovative Technologies and Solutions in Clean Tech and Sustainable Land Management. It was a competition directed to the private sector and companies could apply in four different categories. For example, solutions to decarbonize growing urban environments, or technologies for clean and efficient energy generation and storage. And uh, for this, we teamed up with two other UN organizations, which are also based here at the UN campus in Bonn, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, and the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. And that call was really a huge success. We received nearly 300 applications from 71 countries. And what is important to mention is that 47% of the applicants were startups and 40% of the applicants were medium and small enterprises. And I think this is interesting because the award was not a monetary one, 
but the awards were visibility and partnerships. And um, I would like to give an example because one of the four winning companies was Polycare, a German company which developed a technology to build houses without using cement. And cement is responsible for 8% of the global emissions. So with their building material, you can build houses with 87% desert sand or any other material, which is mixed with polymer resin. And that itself is made to 80% by recycled PET bottles. So this, is, this liquid then is filled into kind of Lego bricks. Maybe you can see these kind of bricks here. And that even allows with these bricks, which can be sticked together, even unskilled workers uh, to build houses. Um, this invention, this is really a game changer and that makes really a difference in the construction industry, makes it more sustainable, it can be dismantled even, and that's an example for the type of innovative companies we are supporting. So what they needed is to support, um, is the support to expand to African countries where partnerships with ministries, with building companies, with investors, and we supported them to showcase their solution at the climate change conference at COP26 in Glasgow, where they gained a lot of new relevant contacts. And then, for example, at the German Nigerian Business Forum, we organized more than 20 bilateral meetings for them, or also enabled their participation at the multi stakeholder forum on science and technology and innovation for the SDG, the STI forum, which I guess many of you might know. And uh, yeah, that really helped the company to establish useful contacts, to find partners and to scale their activities. And then I would like to give a second example of how ITPO Germany builds partnerships which are related to standardization. Because last week we conducted a study tour for high level industry representatives from the steel and cement industry from Egypt and uh, Nigeria. And one of the representative, he's responsible for the energy efficiency program in the steel plant. And uh, he has managed all energy management system activities that led to the ISO 5001 certification. So we visited a German steel factor, factory on Friday, which is also ISO 5001 certified. And that gave him the opportunity to get information on new technologies, on new tools and to build up new partnerships. So these are just two examples which I would like to give to show how ITPO Germany builds partnerships between innovative companies and institutions, investors and business partners. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, by the way, uh, you respect the time since, but you are save some seconds, so we, we use them. Uh, uh, on your credit, obviously, because I remember very well also you did a contest, but it was not maybe your ITPO, but it was coming from Germany in order to uh, boost the partnership for innovation on yes. some solutions to fight COVID-19. And I remember many, that many was, good solutions. Yeah. That was that yours? That was ITPO Italy. That was ITPO Italy actually okay. doing this global call in 2020. And we took up this idea because UNIDO is doing such a call now each year, the ITP network. This year, it will be the ITPOs in China conducting the global call, it's called. And it's always a competition directed, like in the case of COVID-19, it was also including more institutions like research and so on. And our call was directed di just to the private sector because we wanted to have really applicable solutions for clean tech and sustainable land management. Yeah, this yeah. year will be ITPO China or two, the two ITPOs in China doing it jointly. Excellent. And so since UNIDO created 50 years ago, also Whitro, which is a kind of, uh, let's say, network of uh, uh, research industrial, um, let's say, centers. And so they have the same spirit also of uh, boosting cooperation on research and development for innovation of SMEs. And I think this is a good idea. Other institutions we have created also are uh, replicating such kind of idea and uh, the way we work. Thank you very much, Vanessa. So uh, don't move out because we will come to back to you for a second question later. Thank you. So I will ask Yuko. Uh, Yuko, um, by the way, from, from um, Japan, you have also similar stories to share with us? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Raymond and the organizers uh, they, to give me this opportunity. Uh, they, I would like to introduce another concrete case of uh, the Japanese SME. The name of the SME is uh, the Taisei Plus, a typical, very typical Japanese SME specialized in uh, the joint technologies, uh, which could expand its business uh, with the help of standards. The number of uh, the company's employees, only 43. Uh, some years ago, uh, the Taisei Plus uh, they successfully developed a nano molding technology, which enables hybridization of metal and plastics uh, without uh, using adhesive or glue, without using bolts and nuts or any kind of uh, the, the, such devices. Uh, the nano molding technology apparently leads to uh, decreasing uh, the production cost and production time. Uh, more precisely, nano molding enables uh, the very tight combination uh, the, of nano sized bumps and dips. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the scientifically uh, proved thing. Uh, the, but a uh, few years after the development of the technology, uh, the company, Taisei Plus, said it could not appeal sufficiently uh, the technology's advantages to potential users, uh, such as consumer electronics appliance manufacturers or auto parts manufacturers and so on. Government of Japan and JISC, JISC, Japan Industrial Standards Committee, cooperatively encouraged uh, Taisei Plus to establish an international standard to demonstrate the technology's advantages by defining uh, appropriate evaluation method and proposed to ISO. At, the, at that time, so I was working for uh, the Ministry of uh, the Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan and I worked uh, as uh, the, I served as uh, the, uh, the Secretary General of uh, the Japan Industrial Standards Committee. Uh, yes, and the, that standard is ISO 19095, uh, the evaluation of the adhesion interface performance in plastic metal assemblies. Uh, this technology is widely used in various manufacturing sectors today. And this case eloquently shows that the standardization is a very important tool, not only for big companies uh, and their consortia, but also for SMEs and startups. ITPO's mandate is that, as you may know, uh, to promote uh, the investment and the, the technology transfer from Japan to uh, developing and emerging countries. And the, uh, we are operating uh, the an online database called STEP, a sustainable technology promotion platform to feature uh, energy and energy technology, environmental technology, agribusiness technology, human health technology, and disaster management technologies. And we are now trying to uh, push uh, the, this idea. So promoting standardization and uh, the enhancing uh, the competitiveness of SME uh, the, uh, with uh, the, uh, the step. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuko. Also very respectful of the time and very, very important to remind us standards to help to boost innovation. It's very important. And uh, this is your experience. So we are, thank you very much, uh, Yuko. We are coming now here. Uh, in Vienna, the people who are with me uh, going directly to Isabel to ask you uh, which kind of experience you would like to share with us in terms of boosting innovation of SMEs. Thank you, Raymond. First of all, let me thank you, Unido and ISO, for the organization of this seminar and also for this invitation. Uh, also, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all my peers and colleagues from ISO TC279 because all the work we have been developing and the insights and knowledge we shared is valuable and I think it is a common, um, a common uh, input uh, uh, I wanted to, to, to share. 
uh, also, of course, a special thanks to the Portuguese uh, Institute for Quality and National uh, Innovation Agencies that have been partners in uh, our for our TC in Portugal, helping us to achieve uh, uh, common goals and especially to uh, engage uh, more uh, companies in this innovation journey that we want to stimulate. And of course, uh, having uh, as their role uh, to launch public policies for their purpose, they have been creating awareness programs also uh, through uh, the public channels that they, that they use. So concerning uh, your question and our topic, um, I'm in a privileged position because in Portugal, SMEs represent more than 99% of the, the total number of companies. So we, we know quite well um, their problems and their challenges, and they have been engaged in these um, innovation management systems implementation um, that we have launched in 2006 in, in Portugal. Uh, and innovation matters. Innovation matters because, as we have seen from the last OECD also outlook for entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, those uh, innovative companies, uh, the innovative companies were those who were more resilient, uh, as also in UNIDO documents we have we have uh, uh, these already mentioned. So, uh, in fact, it is, it is referred that uh, innovation skills uh, are critical for resilience for, uh, in SMEs. Um, and also in our innovation management system, we are uh, promoting this idea of adaptability and flexibility that are so relevant for SMEs to adjust uh, in an agile approach to the changes that the uh, environment uh, brings uh, in new business conditions. So uh, these skills are really critical for recovery uh, ahead going, going forward. And um, in several studies, we have also demonstrated that uh, these uh, SMEs that are more innovative, that are, are also more prepared to handle uh, a crisis situation, to face a crisis situation. So we have here new challenges uh, ahead of us to promote several processes uh, facilitating their adaptability and a more agile response to these quick changes that we are facing all the days. Also, uh, SMEs uh, are one of the key elements of an innovation ec ecosystem, as you have highlighted, Rema, before, before me, uh, because SMEs do not operate in isolation. And uh, in Portugal, really, we are uh, also working in this uh, concept of innovation ecosystems because we know that uh, their innovation journal, journey is influenced and influences also other uh, organizations such as universities, technological centers, um, and also some public policies and regulation. Uh, so, in my view, collaboration through partnerships or other strategies, such as open innovation, um, is crucial for accelerating knowledge transfer and absorption. Uh, that really is a key element for innovativeness and to co-creation and to generate new opportunities for value creation. I wanted just to share some highlights of a study I have developed uh, uh, concerning the Portuguese participation at uh, Eureka par uh, Partnerships. So Eureka is a joint pro program engaging many countries. Uh, and uh, uh, I have studied the business participation in Eureka Partnerships. Um, and I have concluded uh, through different methods I applied, um, I have concluded that the main effects and impacts from these partnerships at SME's level uh, were, um, first of all, access to knowledge. And that means knowledge that company had not internally before they uh, entered this joint partnership 
Also, they captured best practices for more, from more advanced and mature companies. For instance, when a SME works together with a multinational in a, in a joint partnership, of course, uh, she will absorb a lot of the best practices and also from their more mature processes. Um, also new ideas, generation and new international projects. So these are impacts that it was possible to get uh, demonstrated through my study. But uh, collaboration means also trust and trust needs time. And what we know now at uh, country level is that uh, most of the public policies are short term policies. And um, even if we consider some programs for a three to five years um, uh, time horizon, sometimes is not enough to nurture the innovation ecosystem as we need it to promote SME's development through this innovation journey. So also public policies um, must address these needs and they also must address the fact that we are not talking anymore about individual actors. We are talking mostly about collective and uh, joint activities that are um, promoted and developed in in a innovation ecosystem um, approach. So uh, there is a need, in my view, of a more uh, holistic and systemic policy framework, having in mind and in consideration this quintuple helix uh, model. Uh, and that means all the innovation management standards that we have already in place, um, if a specific, uh, um, a specific place to enable this transformation that we all need in our respective countries. It's not anymore just allocating resources, namely financial resources or human resources um, development. We need to create uh, focus-oriented um, activities for future. We need to balance the present with the future approach and that it's also important to achieve the sustainable development goals, that innovation uh, is uh, a, a, a relevant instrument to, to use uh, to achieve that, uh, that purpose. Uh, two very small examples from our activity. Uh, we have uh, not only a family of standards um, that is uh, mentioned in the handbook, uh, but we also have been deploying in, in, the, in the country several instruments, tools and methods that uh, uh, we are trying to, um, to use for SMEs, uh, S SMEs devo development. Uh, and a self-assessment tool now uh, being used by more than uh, 4,000 companies in, in Portugal have already used this, this tool to better assess their innovation capabilities and their innovation results. And with this, uh, with this, um, uh, with this diagnosis, they can better define their strategy for the future. And also um, the importance of launching a community of practices for engaging stakeholders in discussing and sharing best practices. For instance, in several um, uh, issues that are more critical for, for companies such as uh, knowledge management. So we must share a lot, uh, share more success stories, obstacles, learning experience from companies and disseminate through uh, through our through our ecosystems, uh, bringing more valuable contributions for their innovation. So, in a nutshell, I think uh, really innovation is uh, is a team game, is a sports game. I mean, a collective uh, innovation, a, a collective journey, um, and we are in a transformation 
period because we also must adjust several of the instruments at policy level, but also at business level to match the, uh, the needs uh, that uh, so sudden and quick uh, challenges uh, have been imposing to us. Uh, as it was the case of COVID-19 and uh, now ge geopolitics turmoil and so on that affect the, the possibilities of our SMEs to be more uh, competitive and uh, more developed. So I think it's my contribution for the first round. Yeah, thank you, Monica. I think you have Isabel. contributed for more than the first one because I'm just saying that it was very interesting. And... Uh, um, and you good. You mentioned also the obstacles you are facing when you are trying also to make that happen. It's a good also you mentioned the policy which can so be supportive to what is happening. So very very good. You compliment and we appreciate very much. Thank you. Uh, we are going to ask Magnus also to give him to give us our um, uh, experience by also some inputs on what is happening also from the other side of the world. Thank you, Magnus. The floor. Thank you very much, Raymond. And I'd like to start by proposing a wide understanding of innovation. Very often we talk about technology and products, and certainly that, those are important for innovation to happen, but we need also to look beyond technologies, products, and look at, for example, services innovation, process innovation, business model innovation, and you even have exotic things like regulatory innovation, policy innovation, management innovation, and not the least, social innovation. All these types of innovation needs to come together and we need to have a good mix of all these types of innovations for industrial development and also for addressing the SDGs. All of them, will need innovation of some kind. And to do that, we need to collaborate. We need partnership between different players that could play their part in contributing with those types of innovations. We have large companies, small and medium-sized companies. We have public companies, private companies. We have high-tech organizations and low-tech organizations. And it's not until we can look at that entire ecosystem and how they collaborate across that full range of innovation that we actually can address the challenges we are facing. So collaboration and partnership is at the core uh, of this endeavor. And I'd like to offer three success factors for collaborative innovation to happen. So the first one is about a common language and a common framework. Common language is about the terms we use. Already when we start to talk about innovation, we have confusion. So it really helps to have a common understanding. What is it we're talking about? What types of innovation is it that we are including in our collaborative efforts? A common framework is about understanding the different factors that need to come together for innovation to happen. It could be the principles, the processes we're using, how we look at insights, the strategy, uh, and so on. So that common reference framework for managing innovation is absolutely key to make collaborative innovation happen. The second success factor is about a common understanding of what we want to achieve, the purpose of our innovation activities. It could be insights about the context, the challenges we're facing, and have a deep and common understanding why it's necessary to address these problems. Very often, we forget this very important phase to really understand the challenge, the problem, the opportunity, and we move too quickly to the solution, the technology, and so on. So before we do that, we need to understand commonly why we're going to innovate. Second is the strategy. How are we going to address those challenges? So a common understanding of the purpose and how we're going to address it is also key for collaborative innovation to happen. The final success factors is that we should not underestimate 
the effort, the investment in money and time it takes to make innovation happen. Innovation is a difficult endeavor. It's about navigating uncertainty, learning new things, and it takes time. And we need to consider that from the beginning. Very often we see that it's underestimated. We think that it's, uh, it could be quick to innovate, to solve problems and so on. It is not. It's a difficult task and it requires rethinking some of our normal management practices. So the second factor, do not underestimate the effort to innovate, in particular if you're collaborating on innovation. Uh, it's a serious and important effort. So taking these three success factors together, here is where the ISO 56000 series of standards play a major role to create that common language, the framework, put the finger on the importance of the common purpose, and also uh, um, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, it is a complex and systemic effort. Using the standards that we have in front of us will actually avoid the confusion and speed up and reduce the waste in innovation processes going forward. And that is a very important contribution for industrial development and for the SDGs. Thank you very much, Wayne. Impressive. I was thinking maybe the last to talk normally will not have an argument, but they have more arguments sometimes than the previous one. But so it means, it's, thank you very much, Magnus, for also these brilliant also add-ons on, uh, but also mentioning we need time efforts and also we don't need to underestimate. But the fact that you start making these definitions of differ, different aspects of innovations that need to be there. So we need to collaborate. Thank you. Now, based on your experience, we all listen what you did, at least part of what you did successfully and with some obstacles. We would like to understand. So if you have an unachieved or maybe not yet achieved agenda and you have some recommendations to make here in order for that to happen really in developing countries or maybe around the world, this collaboration for innovation SMEs. And this time I will start with the people, first who are very far away with Yuko, and after that I will ask Isabel, Magnus, I will not leave them for the last, and we talk to the other colleagues. So uh, Yuko, after that, so we thank you for being still with us. What time is it, by the way, in Japan? At 10.45, 10 10.46 p.m. Okay, p.m. So thank you very no much. No problem, no problem. Yeah, so the floor is yours, recommendations. Okay. And so the way forward, a vision, something you would like to share. Okay, thank you, Raymond. Ari, I must be very concise. Ari, first, Ari, I would like to talk about possible misunderstanding in the industry. Many people in industries, especially in SMEs, still think that develop a new product first, then standardize Ari, next, if industry-wise consensus is built. However, standardization is recently required to be placed in more upfront stage, for example, R&D stage. Of course, how to standard, standardize and when to standardize and it shall be carefully checked. Too early standardization may rather hinder innovation and too late standardization must be worthless. SDGs are encouraging the triggers are for creation and dissemination of disruptive innovations, especially for developing and emerging countries whose boundary conditions are, are very, very, very different from developed countries. For example, uh, in water supply, food production and its value chain, energy infrastructure, medical service, and so on. So that, are uh, in order to disseminate the ideas stipulated in ISO 56002, in laboratory, in factory, and in office, the uh, unit has a big potential to collaborate with ISO and IEC, industries, entrepreneurs, and academia to help 
developing and emerging countries for their creation and use of new standards indispensable for, for their achievement of SDGs. Ari, I think human resource development is a key and it's an area for UNIDO. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So standard to boost innovation, if I get you correctly. So not the other way around the way we are used to think about. Thank you very much, Yuko. And so I will ask after Yuko, I will ask Isabel to take us around okay. on the topic. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, first of all, uh, let me uh, share with you some results we have from several studies we have developed in Portugal about our uh, implementation uh, phase of standards in companies and how uh, results uh, demonstrated some benefits, but also some obstacles from, the, from this experience. So the key benefits identified by uh, organizations that have implemented standards for innovation management were mainly five. First of all, innovation management processes or routines, if you want to use that word, that are so needed to have a, a, a more systematic approach for innovation. And in this, uh, we could include also the, the evaluation and measurement process that is so crucial for evidence-based decision-making. The second uh, key benefit, it was highlighted the role standards can have promoting innovation culture in companies and other types of organizations, because it means a more open participatory process and a more transparent way of engaging not only internal stakeholders, but also external stakeholders. Uh, the third key benefit is uh, a very hard topic uh, companies highlight that is knowledge management. Uh, from their perspective is one of the most difficult things to achieve. It is to have this process uh, to capture, to combine, to use knowledge and to make it really relevant for new products or service de development. And the fourth one is the role standards can have, especially those standards more linked with tools and methods for promoting um, uh, the, the adoption of creativity and ideas generation um, uh, mechanisms or, or tools. And the fifth one is uh, the focus on results. In fact, the, the innovation management standards uh, help companies to uh, focus on the uh, on this uh, important characteristic that innovation has that is innovation needs to be implemented implemented and needs to achieve a, a societal or a business uh, solution uh, that generates value. These were the, the main benefits. And of course, on the, other, uh, on the other way, we have some obstacles, most of, it, of them linked to the need to have more support from um, the, the public organizations. And uh, this not only in terms of financial uh, resources, to uh, sustain uh, the portfolio of projects and initiatives, but also from, from the perspective of human resources with the qualifi qualification and competencies to, um, to also sustain the, the SME's innovation journey. And those obstacles um, make me uh, stop here and uh, say another thing that is, um, International organizations uh, play really a very important role guiding countries and uh, national organizations to uh, adopt uh, most innovative and successful management practices. So they have a role in highlighting these practices because countries need guidance and countries need also 
to have some support from international organizations. Uh, and that can uh, bring uh, some difference in the way we align between ourselves um, efforts to converge to this uh, common purpose. Also, I'd like to say that now we are in the middle also of a, a rather a quick transformation in terms of new technologies. And we have the importance of technologies such as blockchain and artificial intelligence that will disrupt the way companies work and innovate. So innovation management systems and standards uh, must take into consideration this technological transformation that will in fact have uh, uh, many implications uh, in, in the way companies uh, work and uh, innovate. And the other challenge I think it is uh, quite important to share with you in my view is that we are facing higher levels of uncertainty and complexity and risk and that may bring new challenges again um, and innovation uh, ecosystems must be ready uh, to generate uh, new valuable solutions for tackling social prob problems and complex problems as we have been also uh, facing uh, last, uh, last years. So um, I would uh, uh, just quickly summarize that uh, we need perhaps to envisage some common uh, activities on four main building blocks, in my view, awareness, training, capacity building, and um, outreach uh, activities for uh, disseminating case studies and success stories for knowledge sharing. Um, that's but, it, thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, uh, Isabel. It was uh, hard and very difficult for me to run after you for the good ideas you were just uh, sharing with us. But I retain, obviously, we as UNIDO, we are doing quality infrastructure for uh, quality culture, culture, because you are saying it's missing in many, many countries. Here, you just mentioned to me something else, quality infrastructure for innovation, culture, development. And you were just saying also results, which is very important for the enterprises. They call it differently, maybe profits, mm -hmm. but you said they need results. And this is really helping them because of these real tools. And all the other things you mentioned, I think, are very relevant to this discussion. It can open also for us new ideas for programs and also other meetings. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Uh, so I will ask the next will be Magnus. If uh, you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Raymond. And I'd like to build on the comments by Isabel, which I thought are really important because the uh, ISO 56000 series of standards actually opens up new possibilities for innovation policy, for policy making nationally, uh, and also for the, the role of UNIDO to play in relation to those policy making uh, issues. Uh, and, and those innovation policies are going right at the core to stimulate collaborative innovation. And I'd like to, to offer three recommendations that could actually be considered at policy levels now that we have this infrastructure of innovation management standards to build upon. The first one, as you point out rightly, Isabel, is, is promoting competence development. It's not obvious how innovation happened in an effective way. It's very easy to waste time, money, resources on innovating uh, for a long time and coming up with the wrong things. We see that all the time. Promoting training so that we understand how these processes work is at the core of effective innovation management. It's broadly an organization targeting managers, policymakers at the highest level and so on. But it's also about going deep. Sometimes we call them innovation management professionals that could be forerunners and they know more detailed what it needs, to, uh, what it takes to drive innovation in an organization and they can help spread the word. The second one uh, is measuring 
or assessing innovation capabilities. Now we have a way to actually operationalizing innovation capabilities. We can say what it is, what is included in that topic that we also badly need. Uh, we know how to start assessing capabilities. We can do that for several organizations, companies in the sector, and for policymakers, that is invaluable information to know what is the starting point? Where is this sector right now in terms of their capacity to innovate? So that they get data to design policies. The third and the last one is about setting targets for capacity building. When we have certifiable standards in place, we can set targets uh, on how many certified organizations we want to have in a sector, for example. But we can also think about personal certification for people and we could also set targets on that. So we could start now to measure a little bit better a complex activity as innovation management. And just to round it off, innovation management and the standards we are producing here are the most powerful policy instruments to drive innovation across the line for all types of uh, countries, I would say, including collaboration across disciplines and borders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your clarity, your straightforward also vision. And uh, I will ask uh, my colleague Bataja to, uh, I hope you are still with us, Diana? Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm here. The floor is yours, Diana, for the vision <laughs> recommendations. Thank you, thank you for your very interesting question. Um, well, in line with the Agenda 2030, it is essential, in my opinion, to make economic sustainability coexist with the environmental and social sustainability of the innovations for uh, development. A uh, significant reason behind developing countries, weak productivity is the low rate of innovation. So, my office is committed to boost the rates of adoption and uh, adaptation uh, of existing cutting edge technologies in agribusiness. ITBO Italy paves the way to create the perfect match between innovation and local needs on agribusiness in developing countries with the aim of opening up with new ways of modernizing value chains in an inclusive manner. We therefore believe it is fundamental to strengthen our role in supporting developing countries to overcome the challenges in agribusiness through innovation and technology. As a matter of fact, uh, these ingredients are fundamental tools to catalyze new flow of in uh, investment opportunities, which enable the capacity of many countries uh, to leapfrog into the future while uh, facing agribusiness and climate change uh, um, challenges uh, and leveraging the new paradigm of uh, uh, sustainable development. Indeed, uh, through our interventions, we try to escape from the logic of no profitable cooperation, shifting from the concept of aid uh, to the one co-development, paving the way for an even more impactful role of the private sector in transferring suitable and innovative technology and solution in developing countries and leveraging the potential for winning partnership between academia, uh, venture capital, uh, traditional SMEs, uh, and a vibrant startup ecosystem rising in the capitals of many emerging countries in Africa, in um, uh, Latin America, Asia, etc., with a great opportunity for open innovation projects that enhance also local content. In a nutshell, uh, innovation and tradition. Precisely in this regard, and to confirm the need to support the local solution for local problems and also frugal innovation, I would like to mention Kanju, a Cameroonian project that our moderator, Raymond, probably already know, that figured out that apiculture can act as a smart solution to protect forests 
from uh, bushfires through the direct involvement of local community in the beekeeping, or also the initiative uh, Pumpkin Against Poverty that represents a best practice in uh, terms of climate change, uh, climate change resilience, supporting farmers and displaced people of flood areas in Bangladesh by offering them uh, trainings and uh, improved technology for the management of li uh, livelihood uh, through the uh, sandbar cropping. Uh, to conclude, we truly think that uh, international organizations and the public sector uh, have a critical role to play in, in enabling good conditions for improving uh, primary sector, but the most disruptive successful transformations in the agricult uh, agricultural sector are business led and our duty is to support uh, this transformation with the tools available to our ITPO network. This is my contribution, my input, Raymond, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. And uh, good. It's impress impressive. You Thank you very, very much, because also uh, you just like destabilize me also with your conclusion, saying the local content. And you recall my knowledge on what happened in Cameroon with what normally in UNIDO we try some, some years back to do like nature-based innovation to use what the nature offered to us in the past, but to innovate and to fix really the hill, to heal the world. And they are doing it there. I will not tell you the story, but it's a lovely story also, a local solution, very, very innovative and deeply rooted to the country. Thank you for recalling that it's our role to give them the culture, to give them the tool, but to make their own innovation that matters for them. Thank you very much also for the recommendation, Diana, because it's impressive. Thank you. So um, please, Vanessa, uh, you are still there. So you have now the floor for your recommendation. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah, thank you, Raymond. So um, yeah, since 2018, we have directly worked with more than 200 innovative companies from Germany and from emerging markets, mainly from Africa. And from that, we have learned what type of partnership they need. So there are nine priority sectors in which the ITPO Germany works, including renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable agribusiness, or environmental technologies. And it became evident that there is a huge potential to take up solutions. But what often happens is that SMEs cannot scale up because they lack the access to the right partners. And also they are so focused on their business model that they often do not see the potential synergies which they could have with other SMEs. Um, I would like to give you for this an example on a successful partnership which ITPO Germany recently had established. Um, where the German startup Boreal Light, which is a provider of solar powered water desalination plants, teamed up with the global leader of containerized refrigeration technology, KTI Plersch. And that means that the refrigeration container of KTI is now powered by solar panels and that the water for the ice comes from the desalination system of Boreal Light. So from this example, my recommendation is it is not enough for companies to be innovative. We need to encourage companies to think along the holistic, the, the lines of holistic solutions. And we should encourage technology providers to team up, to combine their expertise and to explore their innovative potential. And I think in this regard, innovation management standards can be an important tool to encourage such types of partnerships. And what I also saw like last week when I've been to the Cleantech Innovation Festival in Germany is that also other UN organizations lack the contact and knowledge about innovative SMEs. For example, um, what I saw is that UNFCCC, that they have set up a new format, like last year they did it at COP26, the so-called Global Innovation Hub. And there they really find to try solutions from academia and the private sector and so on, because they say just with bringing them together, we can have a transformative ch a change 
and we can scale up these innovations. Um, then another challenge is certainly always financing. So finding the right partners is one challenge and then the funding. And this is why we as ITPO Germany developed an online platform, um, so-called ITPP, Investment and Technology Promotion Platform. And there we will showcase concrete projects of SMEs. It will bring together business partners from developing countries in Germany and will help to find investors uh, for these projects as well. And then beyond the individual level of SMEs, I would like to give a further recommendation, which derives also a bit from my professional experience when I worked as economic policy advisor for GIZ in Georgia, Source Caucasus, where I was responsible for the measure on innovation um, policy and technology transfer, um, where our experience there working with different sectors showed that how important it is to bring partners from academia, public sector, and private sector together when we're setting up a technology transfer center as well. So um, what became clear is that when innovation ecosystems in developing countries are not systematically identified or fosters, then it remains difficult for SMEs and startups to transform their innovations into viable enterprises which attract uh, domestic and foreign investments. And with regard to the ITPOs, I mean, there's a reason why the ITPOs are part of this panel discussion today is that the ITPO, the ITP network and their services are very relevant to help to facilitate these partnerships for innovation. And yeah, this is why I'm also very pleased that we are here today part of the discussion. Um, yeah, and a final statement, because I'm not sure with regard to the time, if we will have um, time for a final statement, I would like to mention it directly. So um, is that companies in industrialized countries, they certainly have more capacities to observe and to follow standards. But um, we need to make sure that companies from developing countries, that they are not left behind and that we as UNIDO uh, also support to facilitate this process and to enable them to participate in innovative partnerships. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we're running out of time. And also she, she was clever than the others, but I don't know uh, if uh, we still have the possibility to give them just three minutes, all of them to conclude. They are telling me no, but uh, in a nutshell, you have been very clear, straightforward, all of them very, inspiring and uh, so thank you very much i'm so sorry for the others but your believe me your interventions and your input have been highly highly appreciated this is the feeling i have if i just read the body languages uh, this is uh, i stuck to that so let's say a big thank you you provide us also to the organizers to unido very very good ideas and you share this experience so I would like to thank you and I hope to have you again in another panel or maybe also another meeting. Thank you very much. And I thank also the audience also for being here with us today. Okay, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying on. Um, and we've seen how strict we are with the timing, so I'm just going, going to go straight into it. And um, thank all of you for being here for this session where we will focus a little bit more 
quote unquote a bit more local on the UNIDO approach to uh, innovation and uh, and how do we do it? And we heard from the exciting panel before on how important it is to have a, you know, um, a ecosystem for innovation and we need the capacities and abilities to innovate. So now I will put my colleagues um, here on the panel to give you some insights on how UNIDO does it. And I'm very honored to um, introduce you to them. So today I have with me uh, Mr. Fernando Santiago, who's an industrial develop, who's an industrial policy officer from UNIDO's Research and Industrial Policy Advice Division. I also have with me Mr. Alejandro Vivera Rojas, an industrial development officer working in the innovation and digital transformation field. And fi finally, last but not least, Ms. Laura Carlota Hohoff who's a project manager from the University of Economics and Business, um, or we know, as we know it, VU in Vienna. So let me take you directly straight into the panel, a very uh, snapshot, half an hour of what UNIDO does when it comes to innovation. So Fernando, let me start with you. You are UNIDO's focal point at the UN Interagency Task Team on Science, Technology and Innovation for the SDGs. Now, can you please tell us in, in a very sharp 14 minutes, how is STI positioned in UNIDO? Over to you, thank you. Thank you, Tipi. Thank you for the invitation to the organizers and of course for the participants. Um, yes, I mean, but basically a, a bit of the, the, the reason why we had this uh, session is uh, exactly the, the, the emergence of all this work around the science technology innovation within the UN system. And um, the role of UNIDO, UNIDO has been uh, for, for many years, uh, since the creation of the organization in the 1960s, uh, very engaged in science, technology, and innovation, right? Through contributing to debates, you know, we produce several reports, technical documents. Uh, a lot of the projects that we do are basically to enable this uh, acquisition of technologies, uh, creating capacities, and of course, uh, collaboration and working knowledge between the developed countries and the developing world. Um, the Lima Declaration also strengthens some of the the mandate around the, the role of technology in development, particularly industrial development. And with the emergence of the, uh, the, um, the, the agenda, the, the, the agenda 2030 and, and, the, and the global uh, idea that you know, science, technology, and innovation and industrial development are two areas that are, you know, they can be combined. And that's uh, this sort of synergetic relationship between these activities is what also drives some of the progress, particularly around SDG 9, which as you know, emphasize the role of uh, innovation, industrial development, and, and sustainable infrastructure. But, you know, you need also contributes to several other SDGs uh, through the, the work. So this idea of uh, UNIDO being uh, one of the entities with a uh, STI intensive mandate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with the uh, STI, but we say the, the STI intensive mandate. And the, the, the challenge here is in, in 2018, so this year we have been doing other work. So when we joined the, the work of the UN around the, uh, you know, the STI, we decided to say, you know, it was a time to also take a moment and reflect on what we were doing. In 2018, uh, we decided there was, a, you know, we do a lot of work on STI, but we lack a common language, we lack a common understanding. We, I mean, we hear in the, in the previous panel, the idea of having a common understanding, a sort of a common goal, right? And so we needed to have so more consistent views of what the UNIDO approach to STI is, how to characterize it, what is the niche. So there's a lot of the organization doing work in this area. We need to define and, and to have a common language how UNIDO works. But also we need to understand how we can move from the projects that we do, the sort of technical cooperation projects and other kinds of projects to impacts, right? So how do we actually connect the, 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 the activities on the ground to the broader perspective of development, right? And of course, uh, one of the ideas that was important is to also uh, how to, uh, you know, build the co cohesion between uh, STI activities and, and other areas of work at UNIDO. And so what we decided is to sort of a three levels of a, of a strategy. You know, one of them is to start with is to increase collaboration internally, right? Uh, and some of my colleagues already in the previous panel uh, spoke about, you know, how some of the activities in terms of the challenges and the, on the, on the context, they go unnoticed, right? And so, we, because we don't collaborate, we don't talk to one another, even here in the house, right? Or we don't talk enough, right? So we had to increase that uh, collaboration. We also wanted to make sure that we can contribute to some of the global debates around 
science, technology, innovation, and industrial development. So we had to have a research agenda, right? And of course, an engagement project. Uh, but of course, you know, partnerships, and we have heard uh, in the previous panel the importance of partnerships, not only ones that exist, but also building new ones. So let me just give you some examples of how the things that we have been doing over the last uh, three, four years. And so uh, we started in 2018, 2020, uh, we started with the creation of a working group, right? So whenever we had a request from one of the entities, uh, you know, in the UN system producing a report, having a meeting, and they wanted to have, you need the inputs. So we sort of, who do we talk to, right? And this was a sort of, I might have to say, informal group. Eventually, we saw the value of this kind of group, and we formalized it in, the 20, in 2021, right? So we have now a working group where we, we know the colleagues in which departments, we have terms of reference, we have a mandate. And the mandate is, you know, uh, as clear as we have these many mechanisms and many others, right? But I'm just giving you a few examples. You know, with the uh, Addis Ababa agenda, uh, you have all the creation of the technology facilitation mechanisms, right? And the STI forum. And also we have several work streams of, you know, the interagency task team on science technology and innovation for the SDGs. So these, these activities require sort of coordinated uh, response from the organization, right? Participation in the high level political forum, another sort of the UN Commission on Science Technology for, for Development, which is uh, one of the oldest ones, but also very important in the, in the system. So all these activities through this work of, of, the, of the working group, we can collaborate and sort of like we say, the one you need approach, right? You know, and this working group has this sort of mandate. Um, so, is it working? Well, uh, you know, let me just give you a few examples. Uh, the, the CSTV, you know, they have this every year, they, they select two priority topics that, you know, member states would like to identify. Uh, last year, they had uh, sustainable cities, if I'm not mistaken, and this ten one on industry for zero, industry for, zero for, industry, for inclusive development. We started from, you know, commenting on some of the document, background documents that we were going to discuss. We joined some of the panel sessions. Eventually, that led to an invitation to UNIDO to deliver the keynote address uh, at, the, at the plenary of the ministerial uh, 25th session uh, last, uh, last March, actually. The recommendations of emerging from that session go directly to the General Assembly, right? So it's very important that UNIDO is given this kind of, uh, you know, space to share some of the work that we do and how we do it, and this, and this particularly sensitive area, which is industry for consider. So uh, that was one of the, the sort of, and so of course, many of the inputs were coming through the work of this, this, this group. But we also were able to uh, <clears throat> collaborate with the, with the European Commission, the, the Joint Research Center. They organized this sort of prestigious conference, European, uh, fo I mean, mainly focused uh, European conference, the Conference for Corporate r and and Innovation. Uh, but last year, they invited UNIDO. So of course, they collaborate with the OECD and EARTO. But last year, they invited UNIDO to become a co-organizer. And particularly, you need uh, having the space to bring some of the developing country perspectives around digitalization and green transitions, right? And so, again, we've been working together with the with the general, with the JRC, but through this conference, also, we are also enhancing the not only enhancing the partnership, but also being able to channel some of the uh, you know the work that you need to do beyond the technical uh, projects, but more of creating the story. So, what is how we contribute to this, right? And so, uh, on around the the, the UNTFM, right? Uh, we had several, I mean, I'm not going to, into detail. So, of course, we collaborate actively to the STI forum with you know, side events, uh, co built in collaboration with this working group. So, you have just one chance to promote one uh, forum or, or one side event. So, we get together which one would be the best one to showcase the work of the organization, right? But you have some other activities around gender and capacity development. For example, there's some uh, comments in the previous panel around the importance of building capacities but also the capacity of the, of the policy making, right? And so we have uh, this collaboration with uh, several entities in this work stream six, which is on capacity development for uh, SSTI policies. We have been putting together with them some uh, you know, trainings in session and online, right? Given the pandemic, we were not able to do activities on, uh, in person. We decided to move online and we have a full program coming from, you know, if you take the policy cycle from the design of the policy, uh, the implementation of the policy to the evolution. So you have these models, experiences, the tools, right? Um, not only the training, but also in this booklet that you see there in between, and that's with the support of the Korean government. So some of the trainings that we have del 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 delivered, now we have a, a booklet that is able to, to use as a, as a supporting material, right? Support reaching for more people. But what's important to notice here is, you know, over 500 participants in around three, four years. That shows there is a lot of need for this kind of services. There's a lot of need 
for sort of guidance, you know, how to use STI, how to connect STI to the SDGs, right? So, uh, of course, across regions, you can see the results. Um, again, on this idea of how to mobilize STI for uh, industrial development and development in general, uh, we have been working with the STI Group uh, 9, right, with the, the, the IIT 9, which is on, on um, roadmaps. So we want to sort of help in developing methodologies. Last uh, three, four years, not two years, we've been working uh, on in five pilot countries, Ghana, India, uh, Serbia, um, Ethiopia, and, and uh, I'm missing one now. Um, <clears throat> uh, but so the idea was to, to sort of showcase and this interesting exercise where many different entities, World Bank, the, the, the European Commission, ONTA, UNESCO, we have our methodologies, we have our own approaches. In this document, we try to bring together all of them and to make consistent uh, recommendations to the member states. Now we're moving to the scale up phase, what we call the partnership in action. But this is a very important exercise where, you know, it's, it's, it's all about partnerships, but these countries are now building a community of practice, collaborating with the, with the UN entities and entities outside the UN that are, you know, with a minded in this area. And then, of course, on the research and engagement activities, and again, and, and I think I cannot stress enough the, the role of the Korean government supporting us in this sort of initial way. Um, we have been doing, if you want, internally, we have an, started to analyze some of the projects. How do we define STI? How do we characterize? How do we represent that in projects? How do we identify the way you need to contribute? And we sort of, we talk about innovation, but we think, yeah, we don't, we, perhaps we don't do it in the way, you know, developing new products, new, you know, sales as, you know, the traditional way of assessing innovation, but we create capacities, what we could say, you know, the science, it's scientific and technological services through training, through uh, engagement, through mapping, through exercises of, you know, understanding the, the, the landscape and, you know, the countries, governments and companies are better able to, to do things. But so, uh, we also have mapped some of the experiences of countries that have successfully managed to use this combined role of science technology innovation policies and industrial policies to achieve some de development targets, right? And then now, I mean, you have the policy when you ask about the government. So what are the, the role of policy makers? So that's kind of the, the way we are working. And of course, we sort of praise this idea of multi-stakeholder engagement. Many countries are not used to that, right? So we are sort of providing some tools on that. So these are kind of the exercises that we are doing in, in STI. But of course, as I mentioned, there's a lot to do. And I think my colleagues now, I want to show you. So this is some ways we're trying to build a story, a narrative around what you need to do and how it does it. Right? But you know, we, we know also there are some limitations. And I think in, in the case of my colleagues now, they will have some uh, um, more examples on what is happening now, yeah? what, is, what is happening and how it's happening. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fernando. And that's a very nice entry point into my two other colleagues, uh, Alejandro and Laura. Um, you know, Fernando spoke about the creation of capacities, and that's what we are trying to do in UNIDO, the creating the capacity to, inno to innovate. And here, I, I want to use this as an entry point to um, Alejandro and Laura, where in 2019, UNIDO signed a joint declaration with VEU, to create what we call an SDGs Innovation Center. So in your minds, you might be asking, what is this? And this is where I, would, I bring in Alejandro to tell us um, a bit more on the center and to really update us on where we are following the, sign, the signing of the joint declaration in 2019. So over to you, Alejandro. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, just uh, this is, this is um, a very good initiative that uh, following what we have been discussing during all these uh, sessions, um, on the, not only to see uh, what UNIDO is doing uh, outwards, yeah, it's also what we are doing inside, what, what, uh, how we can really boost innovation and how we can really boost, uh, for example, how can we contribute to accelerate the path to the SDGs and, and, and to the, uh, uh, the inclusive and sustainable industrial development within the organization as well. Yeah, and that is why uh, our, I mean, the, the main goal of this uh, SDG Innovation Center that we want to establish is mainly focusing on enhancing cooperation, yeah? 
the impact of the cooperation, the innovation, and, and considering also the good context that we are having with the four industrial revolution. We seen this, uh, then we are focusing at this moment in three main areas and, and uh, joining the efforts with the Vienna University, knowledge and, and, and the uh, good uh, programs that they have developed. Yeah, we want to focus on, on three main areas. The first one is how to maximize impact of current methodologies, approaches that UNIDO has. Yeah? And, and for that, we are uh, taking the knowledge of all our colleagues or uh, our uh, networks, even to see what is, behind, what is happening inside of the countries where we are working as well. Yeah? And uh, the second area is most uh, related to how to identify, nurture, yeah, and a scale of innovations in general related to industry. Yeah, and in this particular case, what we are doing is uh, we will try to establish some kind of similar platform of the one that uh, has been established by the World Food Program. Maybe you know that one. It's, uh, they won a Nobel Prize already on that. Yeah, but uh, we are uh, trying to do something similar by establishing a, a more systemic uh, platform, I mean, a platform that can take more advantage of this systemic identification of innovation within different uh, contexts, uh, countries, initiatives, etc. Yeah, but always uh, related to industry, as as we see uh, the main uh, importance of of the industry uh, in the contribution to, for the economic growth. Then uh, the third area is mostly related on, on to what we are doing today. Yeah? How to support more, how to, because we have identified the relevance of, of the innovation standards. So, but we also work in other uh, series of standards, as my colleague Raymond mentioned, it, particularly with, a pro, with the approach of, of value chains so for strengthening the quality of infrastructure along the entire value chains. So, we are also trying to engage more in the standard settings process, in the advocacy, in the uh, diffusion of all these uh, standards. And if we really want to have an impact on this, then we definitely need to support more activities like the one we are doing today. So this is uh, the areas that we are talking. Mm -hmm. Next one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to bother you with all this uh, theory of change. It's just to mention that we have a three stage approach. So right now what we are doing is trying to establish the strategic framework of the innovation center. And in the second stage, then we will uh, do a first pilot. Yeah, of, of the center once this uh, strategic framework is uh, developed, including the theory, I mean, the, the theory of change of the center, the business model, the finance uh, operational models, etc. But what are the different tools that we are proposing within this uh, innovation center? And then the third stage is, of course, the rollout of the center. Yeah. And uh, yeah. We, at the moment, we started with the first activity. And what we have done is, is that uh, we uh, make an internal initial assessment of uh, several UNIDO flagship programs. And this is what I was mentioning. UNIDO, in UNIDO, we have in many areas related to energy, to environment, to agro-industry or agribusiness, or even on digitalization, technology, innovation. We have several programs, several approaches, several thematic uh, areas that are technical modules, etc. that we want to really see what is the impact of, of, this, uh, of these tools, of these mechanisms, yeah? and how to strengthen them or to harmonize the approach in order to really make an, uh, an, an, an important uh, lands, uh, an important escape, um, um, landscape, yeah, where 
all of us can contribute for the sustainable development. Yeah. So in this case, we try to identify projects that were uh, with a high potential to innovate, with uh, covering several regions of the, of the world that we are working, but also uh, with a focus on startups and um, uh, MSNs. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, particularly with gender considerations, this is also important for us. Yeah, in alignment with all the strategies we have in UNIDO. Then uh, the initial assessment. Yeah, for that we have been using a tool that has been developed by our uh, evaluation uh, office, and particularly. What we are doing is uh, based on a set of criteria for um, assessing systemic thinking uh, change, transformational changes, yeah? uh, particularly on, the, on, on whether they are rich in time and space, whether they are evidence-based, what is the coherence between these initiatives, et cetera. Yeah? But also incorporating a, a fifth element here regarding the uh, potential to take advantage of this uh, for industrial revolution. Yeah, technologies and business models. And uh, where within this, we have been able already to assess some of these programs, identify initially where there are some uh, uh, potential uh, ways to improve. Yeah, And this will serve us to match with the uh, pilot, with the initiative on the programs that has been developed by our colleagues from the Vienna University in order to maximize the impact, but also to harmonize our approaches, et cetera, and, and to be more inclusive and sustainable in our interventions for the countries in order to accelerate the uh, reaching of the SDGs. Is this, I think, and I pass. Yes, thank you so much, Alejandro. And it's very encouraging to hear that you're using that we're using the evidence base to support the development of the innovation center. And this is where Laura, I, I give you the time to to bring in the VU perspective to to this partnership. And um, please do tell us more about the oper operationalizing of the of the center. Um, and how do you see this collaboration and effort? Um, coming together through the uh, SDGs Innovation Center. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try not to add too much that was already said, but try to just uh, get some uh, last new words in. So the SDGs Innovation Center will be operationalized by RITA, the Research Institution for Transformational Learning and Impact Assessment at BU, the University of Economics and Business here in Vienna. And as you can read from the slides, what we want to do is really harness the transformational and the disruptive power that we can somehow combine when we really try to bring the SDGs uh, to life. And how we want to do that, we want to do that by streamlining and accelerating impact through innovations. Our approach, I'll try not to sound like a broken record because I feel a lot of these words have already been said today. Um, we want to scale up the impact of SDG oriented innovations. It is important for us to create awareness and a better understanding of the SDGs as an economic driver and as an economic opportunity. If we take a look at environmental degradation and social inequalities, we can use this and try to find a driver for innovation and harness the power that can come if we really scale the impact we can have here. Of course, as university for us, it's important also to focus on um, transdisciplinary expertise in research and practical applications. And we want to enable innovators to monitor and assess their impact together with a tech network partners, which is really important and has already been said in the session before through technologies such as AI and blockchain. Um, I think what I also want to mention here, it is really important for us to not do this isolated. We are a partnership. We want to co-create knowledge. We want to be an interface with society and business. And now partnerships. Um, if you call it partnerships, if you call it ecosystem, I think the message is the same. We um, all need to align our knowledge, we need to share, we need to come together. And for us as a university, 
we call this learning for change. And what we want to do here is to really apply a multi-perspective lens towards technology and strategic foresight. For us, it's important to build these bridges, as I already mentioned, through, to science, business, and society, and provide a playing field, a network where businesses can come together that are aligned in the direction they want to go so that they can share knowledge as well. And of course, the partnership between UNIDO and VU, as was already mentioned, um, started through the joint declaration, where we can bring in together the, um, the knowledge of applied research and the needs and experiences for ISID. And together, we want to create something unique. How do we want to do that? By really focusing on impact orientation, how to understand it, how to assess it, and how to scale it. We want to enable startups, MSMEs, and UNIDA staff to implement, monitor, and assess the impact of their SDG-oriented innovations. Um, and the second thing which is really important for us is, of course, the, the lean approach. Uh, I think in different words, we have heard this before as well. Lean meaning really following also the example of startups that they don't just create something for four years and then try it out, but really try something small, pilot it, get in expertise and feedback from the target group and see, does this really align with the needs that you have? Should we somehow, the tools that we create for you, so should they somehow be changed so that you understand them better? And this is also why it is important for us to have like a one year strategic development phase where we really try out and test these tools. One of them, I'm going to quickly give you some insights in, and of course, we're gonna to try to have a few more of them, but I think time is short. So let me just quickly go into the SCG Innovation Bootcamp, which um, is supposed to be a three days workshop uh, where it's all about um, supporting the target groups and the participants to scale up um, their SDG oriented innovation through understanding their impact that they have through the transformational context. So first looking inside, what is it that I have an impact on? Then what are the outside barriers? What are the multipliers I can connect to? What are the partners and what are opportunities I might have not thought about? And then a very important focus here is to try and utilize the power of digitalization to get interesting new opportunities, how to grow and scale your innovation beyond the borders of, you, of what you might have thought of. And here I think um, it is also very important to know that this of course also goes hand in hand with the opportunities of impact investment that can be created through such a process. And I think I will leave it to this. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here and back to you. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, this is, I, I think some of you have questions, uh, but we don't have time on this panel because I've only got half an hour, but I would encourage you to stay on at the networking um, catch up uh, at six o'clock. Uh, so please do catch Laura, Alejandro, and Fernando. Um, if you can't find them, find me. I will make sure I help you find them. Okay. Um, so thank you so much to my panel members. Um, you've been great. And um, I'd like to now hand over to Johan to take over the next uh, session. Thank you very much. So back here um, for that last long session. Uh, well, uh, so, you know, it has been already a long time. Uh, you're listening uh, conference. So I know that starts pretty difficult, but I'm sure we're going to give you some energy uh, from, in, from a very energetic, energetic uh, continent right now with a very important question uh, with this panel discussion around means training as of 56,000 series for African countries. All the participants for this session are online, so I hope we're, gonna, we're not gonna have too much trouble to reach everyone. Let me see if 
everyone is ready for this session. I don't have a control. Oh, we speak to show that we are ready. Uh, we are trying to see you. Uh, but, uh, first thing is that I'm happy to hear you. Um, yes. Asking. Good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon. Why could he? One, two, three. Good afternoon. Voices. Oh, four voices. Seems on. Can we try to see everybody? Hello. Yes. Now I see you. And. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Everyone is there. I'm very happy with this. That's great. And everyone has the sound on as well. It's perfect. So for this session, um, we have oh, still clicking somewhere. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Um, so for this session, sorry, let me first uh, introduce our panelists today. Uh, so, Ms. Eva Oduor, uh, Chairperson for Kenya Accreditation Services. Uh, then we have Mrs. Nekesa Were, Director of Strategy Af at Afri Labs. We have Mr. Uh, Abdurrahman Njon, General Direct, Director General for the Siganes Association for Standardization and Vice President of RNF uh, for Réseau Normalisation et Francophonie. Well, a lot of people here can speak, uh, I mean, of the panelists can speak French, but we're going to stay in English for everyone. Um, Mr. B. Irie Fro, I hope I'm pronouncing things well, and I can't no, see your smile because the, the camera is a little bit out, up of okay. your face, so, but you're All smiling, right. so, so that was good, good enough, right? <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, thank you. It was okay. Fantastic. Th th thank you very much. So, you're the executive director of the African Observatory of Science, Technology, and Innovation uh, at African Union, the African Union Commission. We are very honored so you can participate today. Thank you very much. And uh, to end with this panel, Mrs. Uh, Catherine Chevauche, which is the chair of ISO TC 323 on circular economy. Thanks to all of you to be here to speak today um, for this session. So why this session? Um, you know, we are here to talk about um, ISO standard, well, innovation standards and to support development all over the world. We had a lot of very interesting thing uh, saying that it's very important for innovation, very important for, for uh, meeting the SDGs and so on. But I would just like to yeah, come back to the to the screen sharing. If you can show to everyone what's hidden behind. Yes, thank you. So we are about talking about standardization of technology tools and methods and interaction between relevant parties to enable innovation. And let's move directly to the next slide to see the map. Oh, you're fixing some stuff. Let me do it. Can I do it by myself? No, I can't. Can we just please switch? Yeah, go to the next one. Well, this is the worldwide participation to ISO TC279 on innovation management. In blue, you have all the participating countries. So people who, well, countries that actively participate to the drafting. And in orange, you have the observing members who are, who are all, you know, looking at what we're doing, to getting access to the document, but not directly working and drafting the documents. And of course, that technical committee has also a lot of liaison um, with the World Trade Organization, with the World Bank, with the OECD, with, of course, UNIDO. But we have an issue here. Look at that map. Why this session? Just because of that gray zone right in the middle. You know, it's something you can't, you can't, you can't you know, miss. It's on the screen. Why is the African country so gray there? How is that possible? So this is the question I'm going to ask you. Uh, I mean, dear panelists, uh, what do, does that mean that Africa, you know, innovation doesn't matter in Africa? I don't think so. Does that think that can we say that Africa has nothing to bring to the world considering innovation? I don't think so neither. So please let's talk about this all together. We have a little less than an hour to do this, and we'll see what um, what we can have on this. Uh, 
the first, my first question will be for uh, Mr. Bieri F. Um, so let's start, we talk about innovation and I would like you, you know, with your high level perspective um, to tell us about innovation on the African continent. Why is innovation important? Do you think that innovators in, in Africa uh, have singularities? What, what can we say about innovation related to African countries? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. It's my great ple pleasure to, to be here on the behalf of the African Union Commission. Uh, I bring to you the greeting of my commissioner who was not able to attend and who asked me to replace him. Uh, the African Union recognizes the importance of knowledge creation through STI. Knowledge improves productivity, competitiveness of nations to ultimately lead to human development. As Africa progresses towards sustainable development, its social, economic, and environmental transformation are highly linked to its STI capabilities at the national, regional, and continental level. That is why the mission of the continental strategy for STI is, quote, to accelerate Africa's transition to an innovation-led, knowledge-based economy. Indeed, innovation as a key factor of economic growth and development is important to solving the most pressing need of Africa in its various forms. These needs are expressed in the continental STI strategy around six priority areas, revolving around food security, energy, health, communication, protection of the environment for sustainability, governance, and the creation of wealth for all. Whether innovation is related to the creation of new products, process, services, or the improvement of existing ones, it is happening everywhere in Africa. And we need to set up an adequate innovation ecosystem to capitalize on it for sustainable development. Important efforts are being deployed by the African countries to improve the business environment as revealed by the recent Ease of Doing Business Index report of the World Bank. Startups and tech hubs are flourishing. The internet usage continues to grow across Africa and the energy situation is also improving. Despite this effort, which are ongoing on the continent and leading to the creation of new industries, technology park, innovation hubs, improved management of intellectual properties, national and continental prices for innovators, Africa countries do not fare well in most innovation indices compared to the more industrialized countries. Maybe, which is also an explanation of what you have shown us uh, with your map. It means that the effort for innovation in Africa must be directed more toward the development, the improvement, and the sustainability of the value chain running from the concept to the commercialization. This aspect of innovation management, in turn, will need capacity building and improve business environment with strong policies related to innovation, industrialization, and commercialization particularly in face of competing industrial good from the global markets. Depending on whether you come from Africa or not, the industrial revolution have different meanings for all of us. The first three industrial revolutions left Africa behind for historical reasons known by most of us. Africa entered in the fourth industrial revolution lagging the other continent. Today, some of the critical points uh, that glued Africa beyond the others remain unsolved. Most African countries lack national innovation strategies and policies, and linkages between the stakeholders of the innovation system, the innovation systems are inexistent or weak. These challenges need to be addressed if Africa is to use innovation and industrialization successfully 
for sustainable and inclusive development. This justifies why most development group blueprints of Africa have focused on investing on infrastructure, education, science, technology, and innovations, as well as improving the contextual factor to reap the benefit of the fourth industrial revolution. For that to happen, the prerequisite action as proposed in the STI strategy for Africa includes upgrading Africa's infrastructure, enhancing technical and professional competencies, stimulating collaborative innovation and entrepreneurship, providing enab enabling environment for STI and strengthening intellectual properties and regulatory systems. The contextual factor in Africa are not optimal for innovation and industrialization, especially in terms of governance and regulation. The major challenge includes limited access to finance resources, low investment in R&D. Actually, in R&D, the continental target is 1% GDP contribution to R&D. We are currently around 0.5% as an average for Africa why Israel is above 4%, Korea is above 4%, for example. Lack of incentive for innovation, inadequate infrastructure, limited access to input, scarcity of education and skilled workers, et cetera. In no regulation ecosystem, Africa innovators are vulnerable in the protection of intellectual property rights and are confronted very often to the lack of trust from investors. Despite this hurdle, the fact that African innovators are evolving in the largest and top market in the world give them ample opportunities to innovate. However, for this innovation to be commercialized, special attention needs to be given to building capacity, promoting mentorship and managerial organization, and improving the governance and the regulatory systems. I will stop here for the first question. I thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much for, for this. As you said, well, okay, uh, if we don't want uh, to let Africa on the side again, we have to work on this innovation and, and make sure to bring them on board, uh, especially in this standardization approach, I guess. Thank you very much for this. Um, we're often talking about, about startups uh, to talk about innovation, but we've seen just in a previous uh, session today that Startups is not the only engine to move on, on, on about innovation and SMEs are there too. Um, it's something we focus a lot in our technical committee and I'd like to get your views on, on this and yeah, thinking how, what, what, how, what do you think about innovation coming from, uh, from SMEs on, on, on your continent? And also another additional stuff you share. We share with me um, an image. Um, we could we could we could share uh, during your inter your, during your presentation. Um, could you maybe we can put it on the screen and you can also say you say us a, a word about this and why why you choose that one. Oh, you you have to turn on the micro. Ah, okay. the image I sent you. Yes. Okay, the image I sent you is the official image that uh, represents the, uh, the continental strategy. I'm, I'm just asking you if you can put, it, put the next slide on, on the screen, please. So please, let's talk about this SMEs as, okay, next, if you move to the next one. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, that's a strong eagle flowing seamlessly. So the slogan, this is the slogan of the continental uh, STI strategy for Africa, the STISA uh, 2024, which is uh, the 10 year increment section of the agenda 2063. Uh, to talk about the SMEs, I think innovation, we all know that innovation uh, come from startup SMEs or big firms, because all firms must innovate to guarantee their success in the markets. But while a startup 
Are you to disruptive innovation to sway the market or to create new markets? The SMEs you to the more traditional ways. I think this has been said uh, during this uh, meeting. These two sectors face or evolve with the more established big firm, which offers successful product to the market with no business model. So these are some of the definitions that we all know. Uh, in the case of uh, Africa and elsewhere, we know that SMEs are the engine of the world economy. Even in the developed world, in OECD countries, SMEs represent around 90% of the private sector. In Africa, it is estimated that SMEs provide more than 80% of the job across the continent. And most, the particularity of Africa is that most of these SMEs are informal. Now, the way we measure uh, this uh, informal sector is uh, on the analysis is part of our project at the observatory here. This number is not so different, as I said, across uh, the world. Therefore, uh, let's say that the health of SMEs translate to the growth of the economy in general. This call for incentive and enhancement measures for SMEs. Maybe the question we, we want to ask is what support, uh, due to the importance in the economy, what support a country can provide to SMEs in terms of financial support, incentive, and regu regulation to enhance the capabilities to innovate in order to make the national economy sustainable? I think that's the question. Due to the proportion of jobs they are bringing, due to the importance in the private sector, how do we take care of the SMEs? Thank you very the much. Innovation capabilities. Yeah. Innovation I'm, I'm capabilities. Yeah, I'm almost through. Innovation capability is central for the SMEs to compete with the big firms. For the SMEs, in addition, improvement of regulatory system is important, particularly giving them financial support, capacity building in different area. For example, skills in setting up enterprises, capabilities for entrepreneurship, and upgrading capabilities of the workforce of the existing SMEs. We can also emphasize on putting effort on setting an ecosystem where startups, SMEs, and big firms collaborate in open innovation system to enhance the economic outcome. I think this is one of the aspects where Africa has uh, really to work to catch up with uh, others. I thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Sorry, I, I thought you were, were finished a couple, what, two, one minute, two minutes ago. So I hope, and let's see, uh, you're right, probably so. Startups and SMEs doesn't need the same uh, support for innovation. And uh, we'll see with this session if ISO 56 thousand series may bring some answers and what also could be well maybe it could be a compliment to to define those policies and 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 so on thank you very much for this uh for, for this first answers um uh, i know to go a little bit uh deeper on 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 the well on operational approaches with uh asking nekesa where to enter into the the session here so nekesa um you were uh, the director of strategy of AfriLabs, and I'd like to ask you, well, is AfriLab has been taking action, I guess, since 2011 um, to foster the development of innovation on the African continent. I'd like you to tell us what, in your opinion, makes the African ecosystem, we talked a lot about the ecosystem in the previous uh, talks here. What, so what, is, what, what makes the African ecosystem special and what do African innovators have to, let's say, teach to innovators from other parts of the world, from your point of view. Thanks, Johan. Um, well, what makes the African ecosystem special? I'd say two things. Uh, the first is um, that as an ecosystem, we are working for solutions to challenges that are focused on our reality. 
And what I mean by that is that, for example, in more economically developed countries, um, you might find kilometers of fixed telephone lines uh, and majority people traditional bank accounts, and you wouldn't typically find that in on the African continent. And so what that has meant for us is that we have developed other ways of, of meeting these needs that we need to meet. And so the fact that you don't have fixed telephone lines or that you don't have traditional bank accounts has really been the driver for mobile um, for technology to develop rapidly and without financial services as well. So we, we really have converted our SIM cards into bank accounts or into bank cards. Um, and, and, and so that's an example of, of how we are really solving um, or making solutions for our own reality. Uh, the second reason that I think the African ecosystem is special would be our diversity. Uh, over 50 countries, over 3,000 ethnic groups, over 2,000 languages. So we are so extremely rich in culture, and you'll find that that sometimes permeates into um, the opportunities that present themselves or even in the ways that we work. Um, so for any country across Africa, you find that even if you're building a solution for just that one country, just because of the diverse cultures, even within countries, that we are automatically um, switched on to, to a very inclusive mindset. Right, because you need to think about the, the, the diversity of the country in which you're, you're operating. So mindset is really key for us and, 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 and specifically a mindset of inclusion. And I think that's another thing um, that makes our ecosystem uh, very special. In terms of what we could teach uh, innovators across the world, uh, for us, we found that dignity is, is very key in, in how we build solutions. Uh, and what this means is that we found that solutions that bring dignity would then transform society. And when you sort of transform society positively and sustainably, then that's a good way to make money. And so the two um, building for societies and being profit making become not mutually exclusive, but one really leads to, to another. And so when I speak of dignity, it's about respect for the people that you're building with. It's about com um, compassion. Um, it's about solidarity with the people you're building with. Do you share a vision with them? Do you share values with them? Are you open to co create processes with them because Africans want to build tools. They don't want for tools to uh, parachute down you know, into, into their countries or into the ecosystem. Um, so are you co-creating these tools with them? And are we ensuring that even when it comes to skills transfer, it's done in a, sustain in a sustainable way? Um, so these are key for us. So that you find that communities here want to be seen as people first. And once you see them as people and treat them with that dignity, then they become customers and begin to, to, to um, consume your products. And at some point, perhaps even become partners. Uh, and I think for me, that would be the one key thing that we can teach innovators across the world. Thanks, Johan. And your smile is participating to that very powerful answer. Many thanks, uh, Nekesa, for, the, for this. Um, what so and this is what you could bring in what what was the challenge you had to face maybe uh, over the last 10 years and what are the challenge that you're facing well through i mean afri labs you're facing now to keep on deploying developing deploying innovation uh within the african continent so there's there's many challenges um but i think for me the big one is what has been said already uh it's it's um the infrastructure right and so all innovation really relies on basic infrastructure and the better that infrastructure gets the more stable the ecosystem right so over the last few years africa has experienced expo exponential growth in internet access um a lot of this spurred by the mobile internet and the ways that we have been able to adopt the, the, the um, mobile phone when it comes to innovation across the continent uh, and so by 2020 we had about a 28 percent penetration um uh, of internet access, but you'll find that still that access and that affordability is still a major challenge for majority Africans, especially those in the rural poor um, locations, especially for women. And when it comes to uh, access specifically, uh, people with disabilities um, have limitations in the way that they can um, consume innovation because of the infrastructure problems that we have. Um, according to the state, so, so there was um, some research, it's regular research, state of mobile internet connectivity, 
Uh, so the 2021 um, report says that Sub-Saharan Africa has the largest coverage um, gap at about 19%, which is more than three times the global average. So, you know, just connectivity alone is such a big issue and countries with better access to online platforms, obviously, um, have better access to business, have better access to education, and are reaping really a lot faster the economic rebounds compared to unconnected economies. Um, the second one also has already been said is electricity. So millions of people in Africa still have um, limited access to electricity. About half of the people across the continent can't turn on a fan, you know, when temperatures go up or can't keep their food cool or can't turn the lights on. You know, in West Africa, for example, um, I think they have the lowest rates of electricity access, about 42% of the total population, 8% of rural residents um, don't have access to, to electricity. So these are the challenges that we've been faced with for the last 10 years. Um, around the challenges that we're faced with now, uh, and, and I think the, a lot of opportunity that comes with these challenges now and what AfriLabs is working to tackle, uh, one is how to connect the continent. Uh, so we understand that we are stronger together. Um, but what this means is that we need to be able to interact better, faster, and, and more sustainably. Uh, and so what that means is that we need to learn uh, or find a sustainable way to lower our borders. We need to be able to travel across Africa easily, which is currently not the case in terms of which visas you need or how much it costs to, to move to the country next door or to move to the country um, um, you know, in the West, if you're located in the South, for example. Um, we, we also have to figure out connecting the continent in terms of movement of people and of products, right? Um, and all of this becomes a lot easier when we have the frameworks and specifically the policy frameworks that allow for that to happen. And so one of the things that uh, AfriLabs is focused on right now is harmonizing these frameworks together with partners. And this is my call to any partners or potential partners out there that might want to work together um, on this. And so what we're looking at is how do we promote easy access to regional markets? And, and try and test legislation, legislation in novel tech areas. And this is really how we want to plug into the policy conversation. So for example, uh, when you think about negotiations currently happening around the Africa continental free trade area, um, or when you think at the different actions that have been taken on data governance, how do we harmonize that? How do we harmonize sector specific regulations for FinTech? You know, um, so, so basically, how there's so much going on, there's so much conversation uh, happening. How do we harmonize all of it to ensure that it works towards connecting the continent, which is what we are ultimately looking to do? Um, a second challenge is funding, and I, I, I heard funding being mentioned here uh, in the previous panel already. Uh, but for us specifically, it's around local funding. How do we increase the number of African investors that are willing to invest in African innovations, uh, that are willing to take those risks much earlier on and that aren't coming as secondary investors following investment made by, by non-African um, uh, investors. What do we need to do to make that happen? And at AfriLabs, we are piloting what we're calling Catalytic Africa. And this is basically connecting African uh, angels, African investment business angels to, to the startups within our ecosystem. And where we're able to make that match, then we draw from a pool of funding that we have and basically double that amount. And so if an angel gives a startup within our network $20,000, for example, then we match that with another $20,000, therefore giving the startup $40,000. Um, but, but we're really calling on more people within this space to work towards getting a lot more African funders to fund African innovation. And then the last one obviously would be uh, ensuring that the legislation um, or policy encourages innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, if you're following what's happening across the continent now, you know that the startup acts that have been passed, you know that the startup bills that are, um, where lots of conversation is happening. And, and the reason that this process takes such a long time is because of, of um, the awareness or the concern that the policies being put in place would stifle innovation and not advance it. And so this is another place in which we are playing to just ensure that the kind of um, uh, uh, policies that our decision makers put in place are those that allow us to work and, and don't stop us from, from working. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so much passion and so much challenge, but so much energy to yeah to face them. Uh, thank you very much, Nekesa. Just two words on this. You know, 
you said everyone is, doesn't have access to electricity or, or limited access to energy and so on. It seems this challenge is getting to be more common all over the world. So maybe you're just ahead uh, you know, of us and maybe we will have a lot to learn from this in the coming years. Um, another thing she said is about harmonization. And well, I guess, you know, this is the point of, I, the point of uh, standardization that trying to, yeah, make organization work better together. And that gives me a perfect transition to move from innovation to standardization and the language between the two of them. So I'm going to um, move now to, well, as to Eva uh, Odur, to uh, to come in the uh, to join join the table here, so Eva, you are uh, working. Um, you know, in when we think about standardization, you you everyone should know here and maybe doesn't doesn't know completely this, but there are several organizations working on standardization. Some are more on uh, distribu the distribution of accreditation, as you are. So working with the documents that have been published and trying to deploy them and uh, evaluate some some companies well assess companies and so on and some as we will see with uh, um, with uh, Abdurrahman right after the after you are more invested in drafting the standards so let's start with this we said we heard from um, from Nikesa right before that you know harmonization and making things working together was an important thing we are now talking about uh, innovation standards so I'd like to know, uh, Eva, what is your view on this and what are st how standards are perceived, well, by Kenyan companies and maybe larger because I've heard also that you have several countries in Africa, several ethnies there, several, um, so maybe it's difficult to make, to be completely general on this, but yeah, so how, how are standards perceived, at least in the Kenyan companies and what is, would be your opinion, uh, what should be done to promote the deployment of standards on innovation management? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Johan. Well, in Kenya, and I think generally in Africa, standards are more looked at as, uh, you know, more from the requirements, from the quality, you know, I make a product and uh, my, what I'm thinking about is, does it meet the requirements so I can, I can put it in the market? And then there's also the other problem where you have like a, um, innovation taking place and then when the standards comes up then it's not they are not matching so that's part of the problem that we have and then the other one is that uh, in the standards when we think more about uh, uh, in the continent really we are more on the products so much we don't look so much on the on the services and yet we have services that we provide so we think so much about uh, the, the requirements of the product. And uh, when, when, when that happens, then you find that we are limiting ourselves in terms of like um, innovation. And uh, it's almost as if it's, um, there are two different things, innovation on one side and standards on the one side. And sometimes you might even think that um, the innovators may even think that standards will, uh, will limit their, their ability and to, to, to innovate. And that's the one thing that we need to really uh, open up the space. I like someone who said earlier on to that the guidance will give like a common understanding of what is innovation, because that's the one thing that at least I imagine that uh, in Kenya or in the continent, I don't think we really have that common language of uh, of defining what is innovation, what is involved in it. And so in the end, we end up with actually a lot of innovation that is happening, but nobody really knows about it or it's going, in, they're all going in different direction or too many people doing the same thing. And, and then, you know, if, if, if this were to be put together, you know, you mix the, the quality part, the requirements part, and the, and the innovation part, then we would be going a long way in, in, in the innovation. And that's where I think the, the innovation standards and the guidance standards become important. And then what happens is that um, the, 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 the AU uh, representative mentioned about the SMEs as the drivers, then these drivers happen also not to be very aware first of 
the standards, and then now, how do you connect them with innovation? So what does that say? That we really would need to have um, a lot of awareness programs, a lot of training connecting the standardization and the innovation so that the two can, can grow together. And then we, we will see a lot more happening. There are very many innovators really in the continent. There are, many, there are very many things happening. And as Nekesa mentioned, if you look at the, the mobile space, the mobile banking and the mobile payments and the mobile everything that happens within this country, it is, it is really, really amazing. But these are not really connected with the standardization. And then at one point, you find that there is some place where you know, things are not uh, joining together properly. And this is where I think we need to, to really take time to have this awareness to the services, to the SMEs, and also to bring the collaboration between them with the standard drafters so that, you know, we can have um, a holistic way of, of, um, of innovation. And this is why I really think that the guidance standards on, on innovation become a very important uh, factor for us in, in, in the continent here. So I, I'm re reading between the lines, but you say that um, guidance standards and requirements standard, especially in dealing with innovation should work together? Yes, I think so. It should not be that you are innovating and ignoring the standards or that you are just doing requirements and not thinking about innovation because then you can stagnate also if you do not think about innovation, yeah. So one for awareness and one for pushing to get to, well, to, to get the stamp on something and be able to maybe go further or at least be recognized as be, being available are being well able to innovate. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. Um, let's uh, let's move to so to uh, Abdurrahman Enjan. Uh, so for the Senegalese, uh, the Association for of uh, Standardization. Um, so your organization is more in charge of encouraging participation of experts in the drafting of standards. In view of the previous interventions, it's clear that African experts have things to contribute in, in about innovation, but still they are not completely involved. We, we have the fact is we have fewer ex, we have fewer experts from African countries in, in our technical committee. So what what's your view on this? And what could be done? What do you think could be done to increase participation? And maybe can we have based this on an example? Um, please let us know. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Johan. Um, it, it's going to be tough for me to, to, to speak after these uh, brilliant speakers. Uh, well, about you're your bri question. You're brilliant as well, you know, that, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the compliment. Uh, you, you, uh, about your question, um, yeah. I think I'm um, looking at the map you, you just shared. Um, there is a lack of participation um, from African countries. And um, unfortunately, we have to admit that um, this is very common in um, ISO International Technical Committee. And um, that's not how um, things um, should be. But you know, listening to our brilliant speakers, it is um, it is um, clear that Africa has a lot to take from innovation, and that standardization um, can help um, implementing the result of innovation um, for the sake of the African development. But the reality is. Um, when you are in our countries, uh, these messages, uh, we don't have them really. Um, I mean, the stakeholders, um, usually they don't have um, this perception of the importance uh, of this topic that are being um, um, discussed, developed, uh, standard developed um, under ISO or 
the other international standardization bodies. That's one thing. In order to engage stakeholders, um, you need to convince them that this topic is interesting, is important, um, crucial um, for their countries. Um, the other challenge we face, and here it's about the NSBs. It is about um, it is about the lack of um, financial um, means, but also human resources. You know, usually may, maybe except um, a few NSB in Africa, uh, we are facing difficulties um, in having um, enough um, technical staff to carry out the work. So we have to choose our button sometime. Um, and in order to prioritize the topic, we need to have the stakeholders in the country um, expressing the needs. Does that take us to what I was saying previously? So raising awareness, raising awareness within the countries, uh, within stakeholders, um, either private stakeholders, but also public stakeholders, so that the NSBs um, can concentrate their effort into um, a particular um, work of um, development of international um, standards. Um, the other thing, uh, and I think ISO is doing a great work addressing that, it is a language barrier. That's something we've experienced, like just to give you an example, my, myself, um, at the first meeting I attended, the first ISO meeting, I was um, the only one from Africa, and I was the only one with France. We were the only French-speaking countries, and the meeting was conducted in English. Um, I have nothing but nothing but to say about English. I love the language, uh, but these are <laughs> these are our realities. Um, and um, so. Okay. You Let know, me just say, I know that challenge, you know, it's not that easy <laughs> when you start. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so there, are, there are different things. We need, we need to um, engage the stakeholders by um, raising awareness on the importance of the topic. Um, and then the NSB will have um, the means um, to put effort into, um, you know, putting together the framework for them um, to engage, um, to meet, discuss, and then um, be fully engaged at the, at the international level. And the one thing is to be um, involved with, to be members, and then appeal to the wonderful map that you showed. And another thing is to actually contribute. And for that, we need to find the, we need to find the real experts of the, of the field in, in question. And it might, um, it might seem like uh, an easy task, but it's not. It's not because um, when you have technical, technical, technical resources, usually in, in our country, they are very busy. Um, so it's not easy to have them um, come and sit for hours um, and discuss about some requirements, um, sometimes um, terminologies. Um, for hours. Um, so really you have to um, explain the, the interest that they have in participating in, in that and what they can bring on the table and what the countries can take from that um, in order to address um, their, um, their challenges, their challenges, mainly um, development challenges. Thank you very much. Well, it resonates a lot with what we heard right before saying we need to first focus on people and be inclusive, accept, or act, behave with dignity and tolerate English, uh, et cetera. So yeah, we have, uh, we have to be, well, it means for them to come, we need to open our arms, right? We need to welcome them yeah. properly, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, and help to identify the right people and so on. Thank you very much. Well, um, to end with this um, panelist list, and I'm afraid we, we prepare, you know, to have two rounds of questions. I'm afraid the second round would be very short for this, but uh, because I really want to let, of course, the needed time to Catherine to get the 
to present us what has been done um, in another technical committee. And uh, we're gonna have a map to, uh, to put on the screen on this. So you're the chair of ISO 2323 on circular economy and circular economy is definitely linked to innovation, I guess, but I will let you explain why. Um, so Catherine, please, what is that about? Why did you accept to participate to this session uh, and the, the language on, the term, on, on those two topics? And, uh, and also, yeah, what is your secret recipe? to bring so many African countries involved. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for your invitation. And uh, no, I have no secret recipe to, to, to put African countries on board, but I, I think that uh, innovation and circular economy really are, are linked uh, because we all know that we, we will have uh, some uh, uh, issue uh, regarding uh, resource availability in the coming years. And because we are on one planet, uh, we have finite space, finite resources, quantity of resources, and we are growing uh, with our population, so we will have some troubles in coming years. And uh, what we know is that we have to change our uh, business models, we have to, um, to think more circular and not linear, and, me, and I am sure we have to learn uh, from countries such in Africa, as said before by Nekesa, some uh, very um, great uh, innovation have been made uh, due to the specific context. Uh, and we, we, we spoke about uh, a bank account, mobile bank account, uh, uh, cell phones and, and so on. But uh, we, we will have to uh, innovate in a resource uh, to be able to circulate, uh, to recirculate, to reuse, to uh, be able uh, to, to, yes, to reuse resources and locally, not outside Africa, but in Africa. So maybe it's, that's why uh, we, we, we have the, not, not all the continent that you can see, but uh, we have 20, 21 countries from Africa participating to uh, the Circular Economy Technical Committee. Most of them are participating countries. That means that they, they, they can make some comments, they can uh, vote, uh, so it's, uh, that's okay. But as said by uh, Abdurrahman, um, we, 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 they have some lack of financial means, uh, human resources, as said, and uh, the language is also uh, for West Africa, not East Africa, but uh, is, it, 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 is also um, um, something not easy to to uh, to, to manage. So um, I, I try to push uh, uh, African participation with uh, specific uh, specific organizations. One or two examples. Um, I, I try to push some twinning between uh, different countries. So uh, uh, to, to manage and to, to manage uh, some working groups. For instance, we have Japan plus Rwanda managing a working group on business model, how to transition for, from a, a, a linear business model to a circular business model. And that means that we, have to, we will have to innovate, not only on technical point of view, but also uh, not only with technologies, but also with uh, behaviors um, and this kind of social innovation. And uh, so twinning, uh, twinning is one of the solution. Um, other uh, means of participation, uh, for instance, to, uh, uh, to push some uh, uh, training uh, to, to, to be able to better understand uh, ISO um, process and to better understand uh, uh, specificity of circular economy. So before each uh, technical committee meeting, uh, I try to uh, push a training session. And I asked already to ISO uh, to make a sponsorship program for specific experts coming from uh, different countries, but specifically uh, African countries, uh, to be able to participate uh, to to uh, to this uh, to this committee. And the next uh, the next um, uh, technical committee meeting uh, will be in Rwanda, uh, so in Africa, and I am very proud of that <laughs> to to be able to have this meeting in Rwanda. Uh, because uh, I hope that uh, uh, due to the sponsorship program of ISO and uh, different uh, networks, we will be able to, uh, to have uh, a lot of African experts there. 
So, but they, they, they have to take the lead and they have to, to comment the text and to, to be part, really to be part of the text, because if they are part, they will be able to, to better apply and to better um, uh, show to other countries that they, 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 they can have some answers and, and we can learn from, uh, from African countries uh, on this specific topic on circular economy, I'm sure of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, you mean there are some operational way to do that yes. finally, and we just have to face this and, and work on that, on it. Uh, thank you. Exactly. We can we can stop the screen sharing, so we will see everyone again. Uh, so again, I'm sorry, we're going to have enough time. We, we're not going to have enough time to make a second round, but I would just like to give. Uh, okay, one one sponsor there, uh, but I think we have the great chance to have a policymaker uh, in here with um, the area of role related to the African uh, Union. So, please, would you accept to make the the final final word on this session? What what you've heard? What you think about this relation between you know standardization and innovation? Do standards about innovation? development and uh, innovation management. We've seen that it's important. Innovation is important for Africa. Of course, innovation startup may be a tool too. And also it's possible to, well, African people might have something to say about uh, on these standards. So what's your feeling at the and, and your concern at the end of this session? Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, we had uh, great input uh, during this session. Uh, it, what I want to say is I want to put the standardization in the center of uh, Africa's industrialization. You have uh, a nascent industry coming uh, in a competition with, in global market with more established ones. If you do not have, if your product do not have the standard, they are not going to be competitive. So that is the importance of standardization. So one of the main reasons of the lack of competitiveness of industrial good coming from Africa is the poor compliance with international standards. So that is why coincident to this, uh, the prime importance of this, the African Union is taking some actions. For example, uh, the objective of the African continental free trade area is to improve the ability of African service suppliers to meet regulation and standard at the international, continental, regional, and national levels. That's one. The second thing I would like to say is what we are doing here in the continent that fits the mainstreaming of ISO uh, 56000. Uh, at the Observatory of uh, Science, Technology of, and Innovation, we have a program given by the 55 member states of Africa. And this program is about uh, assessing the national innovation systems of the countries. This is very important because it has, this program has some of the components of the ISO 56000 streaming like teaching the basics to, uh, of innovation to countries, teaching how uh, the main stakeholders should behave to maximize the output and the outcome of innovation. We are rolling this program and we have already about 25 countries that have gotten the program and we are going around. The next country is, for example, Seychelles. So we are running this program and we think this program is uh, really complementary to what is uh, proposed here in the mainstreaming of ISO 56. We have also uh, the, the policy, development of innovation policy. So we do that with the UN merits in collaboration. We develop those courses that we teach to African countries at the observatory in collaboration with uh, SUSES UK and uh, Unimeric. So there are things on the ground that could complement what is proposed here for uh, 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 mainstreaming ISO 56000 for African countries. I thank you.
thank you very, very much. Uh, we've been very efficient and we save some time because we started, we had, we finally took less than an hour, but we're still um, late on the program. So I would like to thank you very much, Ex if, except if someone, will win, I mean, in the, in the table here, uh, will regret not to have said a very specific thing. Uh, just raise hands and jump on the micro now. Otherwise, we'll end this session. I would like, again, to thank you very much for this. And give the floor for the conclusion and the concluding words uh, from our speakers here. Thank you very much. And uh, well, looking forward to keep working with all of you on increasing the African participation within ISO TC 279 on deploying ISO 66000 series standards on the African continent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have arrived to the end. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for standing with us in this long session. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, Johan and, and, and the previous speaker for the uh, enlightening conversation on mainstreaming ISO 56,000 series for African uh, continent, countries. In particular, we saw that this could be an important session for, uh, for the uh, working groups here present. So you can also consider the context of, of the continent that is not well represented uh, during this uh, development of the standards at this moment. Yeah. We are uh, extremely honored to have all of you and, and the different speakers we have uh, today in the sessions here in uh, UNIDO headquarters, but also online uh, with uh, virtual participation, etc. We have around 96 uh, participants at some moment. Um, we really thank all of you for sharing your knowledge, your experiences, uh, your insights on the various perspectives on the field of innovation standards. Uh, today marks the official launching of this uh, handbook on innovation management, a collaborative effort between UNIDO and the ISO. And we are very delighted to have experts working directly on the ISO UNIDO innovation management handbook uh, to guide us through the development of, of this uh, handbook for organizations, particularly small and medium-sized enterprises. I would like to mention that UNIDO ISO also jointly developed an online uh, training course on innovation management, which is uh, now available in Spanish and English. Yeah, and you can find this one in the UNIDO Knowledge Hub online. This is public available. We are aware that SMEs play an important role in countries' performance. Today, representative of UNIDOS, ITPOs, network in Japan, Italy, and Germany, as well as professionals in innovation management, uh, participated and shared their expertise, best practices, and using partnership to foster innovation in SMEs and startups. Indeed, it was very insightful. We have uh, the opportunity to present UNIDOS highlights on, on the uh, innovation uh, work that we are doing, such as the UNIDO STI working group and the ongoing uh, UNIDO Vienna University experience, uh, the innovation, the SDG Innovation Center, as well as some innovation tools available at the Vienna University to further promote this uh, innovation and maximize impact and effect on SMEs and startups. Finally, we move our attention, as I mentioned before, to the African continent and discussing how to uh, further mainstream the ISO 56,000 series in, the, in these uh, countries. I would like uh, to thank you all of you very much. Uh, this innovation seminar is a partnership between UNIDO and ISO. Uh, therefore, I would like to invite uh, representatives of both organizations to make a few words for concluding the session. Uh, I am glad to give the floor to Ms. Monica Ibido, Technical Program Management ISO Central Secretariat, who will address us on, on, on how these standards are re relevant. Same. 
Thank you very much, Alejandro. Estimated experts and colleagues, it has been really a very interesting event and discussion uh, today. Uh, it would be very difficult to draw to draw conclusion to draw conclusion, but I will try to do it quickly. So, let's say that uh, we started uh, uh, with the general consideration that innovation is really a key factor to competitive growth and employment because it helps transitioning towards a climate neutral and sustainable economy and promote well-being of the society. Faced to global challenges of pandemics, sustainability of our planet, extreme climate conditions, scarcity of resources, rapid digital transformation, population getting older, I think it is becoming imperative for organization of any type and size to focus on their capacity to innovate and manage their innovation activities and process in a sustainable, durable, effective and efficient way as to reach the expected outcomes. And this of course means the ability to understand and respond to the changing contextual condition, foreshow new opportunities, stimulate the creativity and collaboration as a competitive and strategic tool. We talk about, we talk about the relation between standard and innovation we were saying, can they go together? Are they counterintuitive concept? First, let me say that standard, the standardization process itself is a source of innovation because it's about sharing technical knowledge, sharing the latest state of the art within a community of interested stakeholder in response to mass market needs. Standard enable knowledge transfer, transfer because they reflect good practices. And then of course, standardization can have one or more specific objective, make a product or process or services fit for its purpose. And this objective can be not limited, but also enlarged to compatibility, interoperability, health and safety, environmental protection, quality, and even promotion of innovation. So from one side, we have standardization. From the other side, we have innovation that seems to be really explorative in nature characterized by a certain uncertainty, at least at the beginning, with experimentation and learning, because it is a radical change in the way we do things. So at the first glance, the two things, standardization and innovation, seem not to go together. But in reality, innovation seems an a structural process, but it has been shown that innovation activities can really benefit from a common framework and a systemic approach. We heard that ISO TC 279 standards in particular support the uh, development of innovation dynamics within organization. They facilitate collaboration. They help defining common principle, a common framework. They help developing the cap capability to innovate by managing and structuring the innovation process, implementing innovation system efficiently bringing innovation successfully to the market. And we also heard they facilitate communication, knowledge transfers and common understanding of what in is innovation is about. So as a conclusion, I would say standard innovation, really it's a win-win relationship. Since 2013, uh, ISOTC 279 Innovation Management under the Secretariat of the French uh, National Standardization Body, AFNOR, is dealing with standardization of terminology, tools, methods, and interaction between relevant parties to enable innovation. Based, of course, on the WTO principle of transparency, openness, consensus, market relevance, and stakeholder involvement, Experts from almost 60 countries and from different backgrounds, public institutions, university, research center, NGOs, companies are working together on developing voluntary and consensus-based standards supporting innovation, providing solutions to global challenges and sharing knowledge and best practice in innovation management. I really like the definition of innovation in, in TC279 which is defined as new or change entity realizing or redistributing, redistributing sorry, value, where entity can be a product, process, service, model, a method, and where value can be either financial or non-financial, a strategic advantage, a knowledge acquisition, sustainability. So if successfully managed, innovation really creates value. It generates economic and social value, meaning a positive impact on stakeholders, 
through the performance and implementation of activities in new and better ways. The overall TC279-56,000 family of standard of innovation management globally offer a systemic approach to integrate innovation into all layers of in the organiz any organization, offer tools and methods to manage efficiently and effective innovation activities and innovation management system. So why managing innovation actually? Because ideas and innovation may not be sufficient alone to generate and distribute lasting values. Because of global competition, because of consumer demand, the change or require organization to innovate regularly, rethinking their production and organizational process to design new way of doing business. Organization often struggle to make the innovation an enduring and sustainable part of their business. So, while innovation may appear something creative and without any, struct any structure, innovation rarely happens by chance and is more likely to result from an organized process. So accepting the innovation is the result of a process means that it's possible to organize activity in such a way that innovation is more likely to happen. And to do this, uh, organization could implement an innovation management system and use the innovation management system standard. And this is what is ISO 56002 innovation management system guidance talks about. But besides the uh, 02, the TC is also the technical committee has produced other very relevant standards and such as the 56001 fundamentals and vocabulary, which is about terms and definition, but also eight fundamental innovation management principle that I'm just quoting, very interesting, realization of value, future focused leaders, strategic direction, organizational culture, exploit the insight, manage uncertainty, adaptability and system approach. These are combined with other standards of the same series about tools and methods for innovation partnership, for intellectual property management, strategic intelligence management, ideas management, innovation operation measurement, and innovation management assessment. So in a nutshell, the standard of two, Technical Committee 270 now expect to provide several benefits. Market benefit for company organization, including SMEs, providing guidance on how an organization can meet the customer need, but also maximize business opportunity and open new markets and also promote labor market growth. Cultural benefit, promote the growth of innovation culture within organization in line with the organizational strategy and vision. So stimulate an open mind to accept new business model and methods. And as we heard today, share a globally accepted common language for innovation management. Also organizational benefits, save costs, increase the ability to take decision better and manage the uncertainty. Also benefit, as we heard, for policymaker, public institution, because standards can be a solid basis for creating public policy or program that support innovation or better that support collaborative innovation. In May 2019, UNIDO joined uh, ISOTC 279, a relation with UNIDO that is extended since many, many years. And since then, UNIDO is actively contributed to the TC, to the technical work, and the event of today is just an example. This cooperation, ISO and UNIDO, is fruitful for the development, promotion, scaling up, dissemination of innovation tools and methods, especially to foster entrepreneurship and to enhance productivity, sharing knowledge, promote sustainable development, resilience, and human well-being in all the countries and in developing countries, unlocking their potential. The UNIDO ISO Innovation uh, Seminar was actually, as Alejandro said, the event launching the joint publication of the handbook that was made with the support of the ISO TC 279. It is a tangible result of the ISO UNIDO collaboration. And as you know, handbooks are value added products that support the implementation of specific standards and specifically targeted to some user groups. And in this case, specifically focused on SMEs that are main driving force behind economic growth, innovation, and employment. We were pleased to see that the full section was devoted to mainstream 56 series for African countries. 
ISO T system 79 yet some eco we would like to increase the participation of African and other development countries in the TCs. And to do this, we need to increase the capacity building support to ISO member bodies, increase partnership, increase uh, twinning programs and sponsorship programs. In conclusion, ISO TC 279 looks forward to continue successful the collaboration with UNIDO. This collaboration, ISO UNIDO, is a key to support the achievement of UN SDGs, in particular Goal 9, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. This collaboration will allow us to join forces, enlarge our respective networks of members and partners around the world, broaden global partnership and innovation and inclusiveness. Let me thank you once again, UNIDO, for putting together this exceptional panel of experts uh, today, and we look forward for a brighter future, innovating together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. This is uh, really very impressive. Um, we will now we will now listen to some closing statements from Mr. Bernardo Calzadilla Sarmiento, uh, managing director of UNIDO, director for digitalization, technology, and agribusiness. It's a pre-recorded speech. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all of our distinguished speakers for an enriching session on boosting innovation standards for SDGs with several diverse perspectives, plenty of food for thought, whether here at UNIDO headquarters or connected online. Expert exchange and coordination with leading standards organizations, such as ISO, NSBs, the national standards bodies, is critical for advancing innovation policy making. We must also draw on lessons learned from the private sector and cutting edge knowledge from the research community, global partnerships, as per goal 17, is indispensable. It gives me great pleasure that the UNIDO ISO Handbook on Innovation Management System has been launched today. It is an important milestone in the framework of this event at UNIDO headquarters. The handbook aims at disseminating innovation standards in developing countries as a capacity development tool for standards bodies, innovation institutions, academia, enterprises. The handbook is designed to provide countries with a practical set of tools and methods to encourage more and better innovations towards inclusive and sustainable development. UNIDO and ISO joint engagement in the development of the handbook represents an additional effort to raise awareness on the importance of standards and innovation, particularly to promote sustainability of businesses. Indeed, UNIDO, in partnership with ISO, developed an online training course on innovation management that is accessible through the UNIDO Knowledge Hub. And it aims supporting individuals working on innovation activities within an organization, particular enterprises, small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. The relevance of innovation to promote ISID is also demonstrated through the establishment of UNIDO Science, Technology and Innovation STI Working Group, which plays a critical role in providing strategic direction and collaboration for STI-related activities within the organization. For instance, through the STI Working Group, UNIDO participates to various work streams of the United Nations Interagency Task Team on Science, Technology and Innovation and has contributed annually to the STI Forum since its first edition in 2016. Other strategic actions on innovation are carried out by our network of investment and technology promotion. Over time, the nine ITPO offices around the world will remain a focal point for reducing development imbalances, particularly by brokering investment and technology agreements between developed and developing economies, particularly to trade, investment and innovation. Furthermore, we are approaching the third year of UNIDO's annual flagship event, Global Call 2022, which focuses on addressing the adverse effect of climate change through the identification of green and innovative technology solutions. 
It ex exemplifies UNIDO's ongoing efforts to assist the scaling of those highly innovative SMEs and startups in the pursuit of inclusive and sustainable industrial development. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, innovation is a critical engine of economic transformation that is vital to a country's performance. This is why the new slogan of UNIDO is progress by innovation. Most developing countries, however, especially African countries, currently have little or no involvement in advanced innovation. We must act to ensure that such countries are not left behind. The continent has talented digital entrepreneurs, but we must create an enabling environment for them to succeed on a wider scale. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, let me express my gratitude for our, your participation, contribution and support to this important session. I would also particularly thank ISO for organizing this event, ISO TC279, and I look forward to continuing our strong cooperation with all of you in the innovation standard field and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Monica and, and Bernardo Calzavilla for uh, your valuable closing remarks and statements. I would like to just to reiterate that uh, we really want to, to give uh, our appreciation to all the speakers and, and the uh, moderators that has uh, participated in today's sessions, particularly uh, to the ISO colleagues uh, from the uh, technical committee and the experts participating in the working groups and to the UNIDO ITPO representative, UNIDO colleagues, etc. I would like also to take a short moment to, be, uh, to have a big uh, thanks to my organizing team, Sibila Suki, who's uh, from China. And uh, also Lochi, who has been accompanying us uh, on this today entire session. Uh, we have two contributors, uh, Nasi and Anna, taking pictures and supporting us with the copies. Thanks a lot. And of course, of, uh, among the architects of this uh, session, I want to thank uh, Leopoldo, Irhairen, and Johan, yeah, as well, as, and Raymond. Yeah. Together, we designed all this session and the next one on Thursday. Thanks a lot. And with this, I would like just to take the opportunity to remind you that on Thursday, we will be having a very interesting uh, session. We call it Innovation Labs. Yeah, Together as well with ISO, we organized those ones. So uh, I invite you to uh, attend that one on, on Thursday, 3.30. It will be in a different room. You will know the details, but uh, we will be delighted to have you on board as well. Uh, for impressive participants, uh, I would like also to reiterate the invitation for the cocktail that we will be having today. It will be in about, uh, let's say 15 minutes, 6.15, yeah? It will be in the Mosa room, so you, you can go there. Yeah, uh, we will explain the details yeah, later. And uh, we look forward to meet you there. Thanks a lot and enjoy the reception and the day. Thank you. Thank you.